person is not interested in parliamentary jurisprudence. If you say so, then say it into the record. We are going to work with the rules. You don't want it? So, Mr. Speaker, with respect, let's go by your direction. Let's go by your ruling. And let's make progress. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, yes, minority from bench. Um, who wants to speak? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what has Honorable Atufosin said? He's making an appeal to you. Mr. Speaker, what I heard the Deputy Majority say is that once we approve the economic policy, this is not the first time this is campaign. We have not approved. Mr. Speaker, if I heard when we were during the budget time, the Minister said this policy will be brought to this House. And if he has come, put that one aside. Mr. Speaker, today is the first time this House is being briefed with this death estate program. And you could see our fathers, our grandfathers, and our grandparents are here. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this, Mr. Speaker, even the majority side, today is the first time the minister is briefing you. So, Mr. Speaker, if even you in government, you are being briefed for the first time, how much more we got in minority? Mr. Speaker, we are not in government, but the minority leader is just an immediate deputy finance minister. He has an input to make. We have a republic to build. So, if he's just making an appeal, now, Mr. Speaker, there are inputs I want to make in the policy brief the minister is giving. Due to that, I'm, up, I'm pleading with you to give 10 minutes. Is it out of place? No. This is not out of place. It's a simple request. So, Mr. Speaker, today is a special day. And, Mr. Speaker, it took the magnanimity of the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs to invite leadership of this House into Koforidia for IMF program brief. The Minister for Finance has never briefed Parliament on the IMF brief. So, Mr. Speaker, we've been looking for him. Today, we've got him. Give 20 minutes each. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I heard the Deputy Majority Leader say that Parliament has approved the debt restructuring program. Mr. Speaker, that is a palpable lie. Mr. Speaker, I have with me the budget statement and economic policy of government. Mr. Speaker, I refer you to page 71. Page 71, paragraph 278. Mr. Speaker, it goes on to say that, Mr. Speaker, details of the debt operations program will be announced soon to the public and investor community after the necessary engagement with all relevant stakeholders. So, Speaker, Parliament does not have the information our Minister responsible for finance has given to us today. This is the first time this August House has had the opportunity to have a bite on this matter. Mr. Speaker, again, the statement that the minister so far has given to the public is not known to us as a house. It's not known to us as a house. And so, Mr. Speaker, if the minister is before us, it is only fair that members of parliament will have at least 10 minutes each to speak to this matter. Mr. Speaker, I believe that as minority leader, I should be given 20 minutes minimum. 20 minutes minimum to respond to some of the concerns that the minister has raised. Mr. Speaker, this is a major threat to our economy. So I appeal to you to grant us that opportunity so that we can debate this or make comments appropriately. And let him not create impression that brief comment means speak for two seconds. My brief comment is a minimum of 20 minutes for, for your information. 
Yes, please. Mr. Speaker. David Tim, are you watching there? Yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Mr. Speaker, order 72. I will read first order 72 and then come to 72 as well. Mr. Mr. Speaker, 72 reads, a minister of state may make an announcement or a statement of government policy. Any such announcement or statement should be limited to facts which it is deemed to make known to the House and should not be designed to provoke debate at this stage. Any member may comment briefly subject to the same limitation. Mr. Speaker, the ordinary meaning of briefly is not 20 minutes as the minority leader wants us to do. Mr. Speaker, if you come to 72, by the indulgence of the House and leave of Mr. Speaker, may at time appointed for statement under the 53 explain a matter of personal nature or make a statement on a matter of urgent public importance. Any statement other than a personal statement may be commented upon by other members for a limited duration of not exceeding one hour. The terms of any such proposed statement shall first be submitted to Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, an interpretation of this provision has long been given by you that the terms of 72, that is the time period within which to discuss or comment on this matter, would be applicable that is mutandis, to the provisions of 72. That already has been determined. Mr. Speaker, I have again, I would again entreat the minority leader that if indeed they have some other tools that they want to rely on, they should rely on it. And they should not, Mr. Speaker, attempt to hoodwink this house. Mr. Speaker, we approved the budget of 2023. And whatever session that he read did not talk about coming back here for an approval for debt exchange program. I was expecting him to have said so, but he rather chose to say what I had said amounted to a so-called palpable lie. It is not so. Maybe you can say palpable falsehood. But you know, I will not, I will not. I will. He knows. He knows. He knows that I will not mislead this house. So far, every submission he has made is outside of this standing orders. That's what you've done. And my reliance on the budget of 2023, on all fours, can never be false. What you quoted, I to force it, what you quoted in the budget. Mr. Speaker, my respected minority leader, Mr. Speaker, what he said did not talk about approval by this house. The minister said he would engage stakeholders, and subject to that, we approved it. Mr. Speaker, that is why when we ask of him to come and brief us, he's come to brief us. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Atto Forsen, the minority leader, and his colleagues, all this while, never took any step as a minority. They never took any step to attend to the concerns of the Ghanaian people. The minister has come to brief us, and you want to get an impression as though the minister has abandoned his responsibility. Why didn't you file a question? Why didn't you file a motion? If you are minded to get more information, what are you doing as a member of parliament? He has briefed us 
he is going by the terms of our standing orders. And Mr. Speaker has given his ruling. Let's respect that and move on, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, honourable members, I think enough is enough. I definitely need your input to be able to manage the house, but our rules are very clear. This is a statement on government policy, and Order 72 is very clear on it. The comments should be brief. The House can at any time come using other tools, particularly a motion, to debate this matter and to take a position and advise government on it. I am ever ready to admit such a motion for debate by the House. You give me an indication as to what is going to happen. Already you started debating, even though you are to make comments, you started debating the matter. But after listening to you, I will not be able to grant 10 minutes, but I will add at least some three minutes, so eight minutes each. I will stick to the eight minutes. I will stick to the eight minutes per person. The leaders will not get the 20 minutes as requested. I think the leaders, to be fair to them, I will give them 15, 15 minutes each. That should be sufficient for the House. We will definitely do justice to it, particularly so as we have the senior citizens with us. You know that they've been picketing for some days now. So it's a very crucial matter to the nation and to some individuals in this country. So please, Honorable Isaac Adungo, take this into consideration. But I want to plead with the members. Thank you very much, please, uh, right, Honorable Speaker. Let's, let's use parliamentary language, not the language of debates in the chop bar or marketplace. Parliamentary language. So please, Honorable Isaac Adungo, you may start. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I feel very sad this morning. Not just because we've compelled our senior citizens who have served our country faithfully, have worked so hard to accumulate their pensions, and when we are in crisis, the vulnerable are the ones we prioritize. They are not the ones we take their money. But unfortunately, today, they are the ones we are taking their money, and I don't know who we are going to use those monies to sell. But Mr. Speaker, are we still a proud nation? <laughs> Have we suddenly no more a proud nation that we are all over the place begging people who borrowed money from and telling them we can't pay them? And there are no consequences for this. Mr. Speaker, next time somebody serves in public office and tells you, I don't want to be paid, you should be very careful. You should be extremely careful because free things are expensive. And it is an example of what we are experiencing today. Mr. Speaker, if managing an economy is all about collecting people's monies and loans, celebrating with cake and fish, and in the end run the economy into a ditch and refuse to pay them and use that to create economic stability, then we must as well outsource this country to an intel artificial intelligence so they manage this economy for us. Because the management of an economy is a lot more than that. Mr. Speaker, we are in this house. When they came trying to find different vehicles to hide our public debt. They came here and said that you can take $1.5 billion, even without a balance sheet, and it will not be a government of Ghana debt. They came here and said, Esther PLC can take almost 10 billion Ghana cities 
and it is not public debt. They came here and said they are bringing butter to build our roads in Sino Hydro. In the 21st century, they were doing for Enchine, Vegimoko, in Ghana. <laughs> Bring pepper and collect salt, butter. How can this group of people that call themselves property owning Democrats are the ones collecting people's properties? So when they come telling you we are property owning Democrats, think twice. They will come after your property. They will come after your savings. Yes. Mr. Speaker, they will come and destroy your banking sector. Yes. We are taking 83 billion, and the impact is that the banking sector is losing, in present value terms, 41 billion Ghana cities. Ah. How do you expect a banking sector that is almost capitalized at 30 billion to survive 41 billion? Yes. So, have you solved the problem? You've rather transferred the problem from the government to destroy our banking sector. Mr. Speaker, how come the Bank of Ghana that is supposed to regulate our banks was sleeping when the people were investing all their monies in government toxic assets? We have a simple principle of single obligor limits. It is a law that says that you shouldn't ever expose yourself to one person. It turned out that 75% of all the monies in the banking sector was in government bonds. Government, 71% of government domestic bonds were in the hands of these people. And the Bank of Ghana was watching on. Mr. Speaker, our pension funds, the National Pension Regulatory Authority said, go and risk 85% of your money on toxic government bonds. Mr. Speaker, where does that happen? And today, today, we are here with this boring and affirming statement. Mr. Speaker, we are not angry enough. As a country, we are not angry enough. This cannot happen to anybody. And yet, you are wasting our money, you are taking our money, and you are here reading this boring statement to us. Mr. Speaker, this is not a joke. And you are even quoting the Bible. Which of the Bibles are you quoting? Quoting the Bible in taking our money, in making us poor, in denying the poor pensioner. It's money, and you still are quoting the Bible. It is the reason some of us don't go to church, because in the end, this is what we get. <laughs> this is what we get. Mr. Speaker, this matter, I want to make an appeal to you to refer this matter back to the Finance Committee for proper oversight. The Bank of Ghana must come to explain to us how they allow the banking sector to help itself. The pensioners must come and explain to us. Mr. Speaker, the Ghana Amalgamated Trust must come to explain to us. Mr. Speaker, as we speak today, the Bank of Ghana is claiming it is going to throw $15 billion at this, pro at this point. Have we approved any $15 billion? They must come and explain to us how they are getting that money. Mr. Oh, Speaker, ever since Honourable this Honourable government Honourable has Honourable office... Honourable members, just focus on the statement. Mr. Speaker, in the statement, it is about our public debt and it's about who gave us the money. It's the banking sector that gave us the money, and we knew with all the rating agencies downgrading us that it was going to crash, and the regulator was watching them until they crash. That is about the DE. Mr. Speaker, the finance minister is required by law under the Public Financial Management Act not to allow us to meet this problem. He is supposed every year in May, when he's presenting the fiscal strategy document to cabinet for approval, to accompany it with the, the, the debt sustainability analysis so that we are not caught by surprise. Is it the case that he's not been developing the annual debt sustainability report? Is it the case that he has ignored the findings in those reports? He is supposed to present fiscal uh, risk analysis to, to cabinet. Is it the case that he's not been doing it? How come we are suddenly surprised and we are losing our money? Mr. Speaker, how are we going to convince any individual to trust in the state to give one penny to the state. We were taught in school, Mr. Speaker, that government debts are a free. Ken of Uriata and his people are now saying you will lie. So we should unlearn all that we learned in school because government debt now is more riskier than lending to Adongo. <laughs> it is more riskier than lending to Adongo. So how do we now go back to reconsider the thinking of finance? That when you give money to government, you can sleep peacefully. That when you work and you take your pension lump sum, and you decide to give to government and live on your coupons, please, you are naked because you will go hungry and you can't buy your medicines. 
and we are proud to come and stand here and be quoting the Bible in telling this piece of faith. How is that possible? Mr. Speaker, there must be consequences. There must be consequences. People can not destroy our livelihood. People cannot ruin us. And when you ask them to leave their office, they say they will move. I talk that we are not paying you, you are not ready to resign. And every day you are giving the other. How can we always be crying because you are a finance minister? This matter must be properly investigated this house. And I appeal to you not to end this matter to this uh, route that it came. And that we must have a proper process to provide oversight and give the people of Ghana the assurance that we just go in vain. And Mr. Speaker, it cannot be by the stroke of pen of a so-called finance minister. That should never happen, Mr. Speaker. And I want to call on the finance minister to resign today by a public announcement here. You cannot be proud of this achievement. You went and told the investors in Europe bond market that you produce 500,000 barrels of oil as a country. Have you produced 200,000 barrels? Your time is up. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We will now have to listen to Honorable Kweku Kwatin, the Chairman of the Finance Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Honorable Minister, for the statement. Mr. Speaker, listening to my colleague, Honorable Adongo, it is clear. It is clear, Mr. Speaker, that the debate as to how we got here will never end. The debate as to why we have had the need to do debt restructuring in our economy cannot end. But, Mr. Speaker, one reality is not debatable. It is the fact that we are here. And like many other countries, not only is our city under pressure, the cost of living is rising and our people are looking for solutions. Mr. Speaker, it is in our interest. It is in our collective interest to come together as a people and find the kind of solution that would make our economy better going forward. Mr. Speaker, that treatment and the domestic debt exchange program as has been deployed by government is good, but it is not enough. Mr. Speaker, the state of our economy now would require more than a debt treatment. Mr. Speaker, not only should we support government to cut the interest commitments in our economy, we must pursue an aggressive program to rein in expenditure. And we must do that not just for today, we must do that going forward, Mr. Speaker. I dare say, Mr. Speaker, that in doing this, and I speak not just to the executive, I also speak to ourselves as members of parliament. In cutting expenditure, charity must begin at home. And we must lead by example. Mr. Speaker, how many times have we not heard the people who elected us into office say that they have issues with the VA that we use? How many times have we not heard our people complain about the expression we take? I thought you said I should shout. Mr. Speaker, 
I'm making the point, I'm making the point, Mr. Speaker, that the problem we have on our hands today is not just a debt treatment matter. There is a need to deal with a fundamental weakness that has characterized the management of our economy for decades. We are reaping what we have sought as leaders, as governments, and as a people. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's not just the politician that must lead by example. Our friends in labor must moderate the demand for increased wages. We must know that government expenditure can come from nowhere but either taxation or from borrowing. And when we put pressure on political leadership, the consequence is what we see before us today. Mr. Speaker, we should stop as a country. You know, Mr. Speaker, because I said, as politicians, we must lead by example. My colleagues want to listen to me. We are never going to address the problem on our hands by pointing political fingers at our opponents and hoping that when we come to power, that we will do any better if the fundamental weaknesses continue to exist. Mr. Speaker, in conclusion on the debt, on, on the expenditures, we must simply stop distributing wealth we have not created. We must stop spending money that we do not have. But Mr. Speaker, it would not even be sufficient to just rein in expenditure. Mr. Speaker, we must embark on an aggressive program to mobilize more revenue from within ourselves. We cannot continue hoping that somebody would pay their taxes in some country and then those people would lend the money to us or would advance the money to us as grants. A country that leads like that is living a lie. And we will be here again if we don't change. There will be another debt treatment in the future if we don't begin to mobilize more revenue. Mr. Speaker, not only do we call on government to be more radical in punishing people who do not want to pay their taxes, I also think that as a people, we must be more task compliant. We must tell our constituents that government can only have money that we give to government. Mr. Speaker, I am confident that if we would learn from the things we are seeing today, if we would cut expenditure, if we will live within our means, we will live a better economy for the future. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, thanks so much. You use six minutes, 44 seconds. Uh, it's now the turn of Honourable John Jinapo. Right, Honourable Speaker, let me first of all thank you for demonstrating leadership. But for you, Mr. Speaker, the Finance Minister won't be here. Yeah. It's not as if the Finance Minister requested upon you to come and brief the House. Mr. Speaker, it is leadership, both majority and minority, no, 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 no. emanating from the minority side, yes. yeah. and with your good counsel, We've had to pull the finance minister today to come and brief us on this very toxic de domestic debt exchange program. Mr. Speaker, the finance minister has spoken a lot. And like you rightly said, we have elderly people, respected people, people from the international community seated there. When you digest all this, what does it mean? That's the most important thing. What has the finance minister told the people of Ghana? Mr. Speaker, I sum it simple. If you evaluate what the finance minister is doing, and evaluate what number one of men's goal did, <laughs> the two are synonymous and the same. Yeah. Yeah. The money is 
I say, there is no difference. Nam two, Mr. Speaker, if Nam one had gotten this condition, his financial instrument or financial campaign would have existed as we speak today. And like Abdongo said, there's a principle in economics known as the transversality condition. Yes. The transversality condition Peter. states that so far as government survives, government will never do. That is why when you are accounting for the capital asset pricing model, there's a risk free rate. The risk free rate is the rate that government gives. If you want more, that is, if you want to take risk, then you go for a premium. For the first time in the history of this country, it never happened. For the first time, government is saying that it is so broke, the economy has been so mismanaged that they can't even honor the coupon payments or money that government took from not just ordinary individuals, but from our old mothers and fathers whose survival, whose livelihood depends on the little coupons that they get. Mr. Speaker, let me do a quick analysis. If you were to invest 100,000, just 100,000, Let's even assume that Mr. Kenoforiata and the finance minister says they will give you all your money. With a rate of inflation at more than 50%, in one year, by the time you take your principal, the actual value, which is the purchasing power, would have been reduced to 66,000. Hey. And you can just check. Just check the value and discount it to the present value with that rate. And if you apply the discounting factor, you know the present value of a future investment that you are supposed to end. As if that is not enough. As if that is not enough. The Bank of Ghana, as of 2021, had advanced over 30 billion to the government. Hey. Then in 2022, the Bank of Ghana, and I remember Honorable Atuforsen raised that issue, that they were giving government so much money. The Bank of Ghana issued a statement and told us that it's an overdraft. An overdraft is a short term debt instrument. Because you must pay immediately. Immediately, the Minister of Finance began. He announced that he has converted it into bonds. Why do you do this? Why? You see, the issue is credibility. That is why the women and the men who are old, they don't trust the minister. Because, look, the president told us that there will be no haircuts. It turned out that it was false. The minister himself promised us that individuals will not be part of this whole domestic debt instrument. He's here. He's on record. On record. Then on the eve of Christmas, he issued a statement that he will not exempt pensioners and he's now bringing individual bondholders into the whole free. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is a serious matter. This is not an NDC matter. This is not an MPP matter. This is a national issue where all of us ought to put our political difference aside Look straight into the minister and tell him the minister, you will not touch the pensioners today, you will not touch them tomorrow. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, this house, I plead with you, and I plead with leadership, that we should pass a resolution that for the first time we are putting our political difference aside. We should pass a resolution telling the minister, I'm not interested in his resignation. If he doesn't want to resign, that is their own cup of tea. Because the problem is not just Kenu Foriata. The problem is Kenu Foriata, Dr. Baumia, and Akufado. This trilogy, this trade, this trade, they are the problem of Ghana. And Mr. Speaker, problems cannot solve problems. Solutions solve problems. I'm therefore calling on Parliament to pass a resolution compelling the Minister of Finance, just as he has done in paragraph 27, page 7, that all the pensioners would be exempted from this domestic debt exchange. Yeah. Not just exempt them. Allow them to clap. Not just exempt them. The bondholders, the pensioners, individual bondholders, their coupon rates, their principal, and the term of the original agreement should be sustained, must stand and stand firm as far as some of us are concerned. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we must learn as a nation. I want to commend people who have stood with us. People like Kwame Pienin, 
people like Kofi Amwabe, people like Sofia Akufu, and even in this house, I salute the venerable majority leader, the honorable Oseche Mensa Bosu, for his stance on the individual debt bondholders as far as we are concerned. Yes. yes. You have demonstrated leadership, leader. And that you have a conscience. And I call on you to do same the old men and women watching us today. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there are three ways that government raises revenue. And Honorable Kakuati, you mentioned two. One is taxation. Two is borrowing. But there's a third one. That is synergy. Printing of money. How can the Bank of Ghana advance more than 40 billion to the government of Ghana in one fiscal year? What is the size of Ghana's economy? Huh? It's the size of Ghana's economy. I'm not surprised that the IMF has appointed Leonard Chumo as the financial supervising advisor to the Bank of Ghana. Mr. Chumo, please let me thank you and welcome you to Ghana. Let me plead with you, please open your eyes at the Bank of Ghana. I cannot trust that governor in one way or one bit. I beg you, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Scrutinize the documents and ensure that the writing is done. Because in this chamber, when they brought the Sino Hydro Agreement, we cautioned them. It's not as if we did not caution them. We are also Ghanaians. Yes, we might be interested in political power, but we are Ghanaians. We told you that, that your so called butter trade will not work. Today you've gone round and round and round. Honorable member, your and you are here. Mr. Speaker, on that note, I want to end by appealing to you that the fiscal responsibility regulation that was suspended ought to be reinstated so that we can avoid this clip. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. God bless you. Honorable, Honorable members. Honorable members, we have been joined by a very high-powered delegation from the German Parliament. They are here on a steady visit, and they focus on meeting the Committee on Legal Affairs. Is made up of members of parliament and the staff of parliament. And I have the pleasure to introduce them to you. They come from the, as I said, the Legal Affairs Committee of the German Parliament. They are here actually to interact with their counterparts gain in-depth knowledge on the workings of the Committee on Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs and other committees, engage you, members of Parliament, on issues relating to the rule of law in Ghana, transparency and accountability in the public and private sectors, conditions of correctional facilities, as well as human rights for all. The visit is further intended to create a platform for networking between honorable members here and their German counterparts with an aim to deepening relations between the two legislatures. Pleasure and joy of visiting the German parliament a number of times. I had colleagues there that time was minority leader and almost every year I was in Germany. So I can testify that there's a lot to benefit in having good relations with the German parliament and the members of parliament from Germany. They are being led by the chairman of the committee, that is the Committee on Legal Affairs. Her name is Honorable Elizabeth Winkelmeyer Becker. 
Chair, you are most welcome. The other members are Honorable Carmen Weiji. I'm sorry, sorry if I have not got it right. You know, my German is almost zero. <laughs> Honorable Israel Leon Limbaka. Yeah. Honorable Stephen Mayer. Yeah. Honorable Till Stephen. Yeah. Honorable Philip Hattingway. Honorable Stephen Brandner yeah. and Honorable Clara Ann Berger. Yeah. The delegation is being supported by the staff of the parliament, two members of staff. One is an interpreter and the other is a secretary. The interpreter is in the person of Mr. Michael John Bakabi, yeah. and the secretary is Miss Sarah Henneman. Yeah. Honorable members, on behalf of the House and all of you, I warmly welcome the delegation from the German Parliament to our Parliament, and I wish them a fruitful deliberation. What we are just witnessing is not debate, it's comments. <laughs> it's just comments on a statement that has been made by the Minister for Finance. And so when we go to a debate, then it will be something else. It's very difficult to get the line right between comments and debates. And so, presiding officers, we have the heat on it. I'm doing my best to manage it. I hope at the end of the day, I'll still have all the members with me. So, you are most welcome. And uh, it's the turn of a member from the majority side, a deputy minister and the minister of finance, our own member of parliament, Honorable Abina Osei Asare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity. And um, I also want to thank the people of Ghana for the immense support we have enjoyed from you in these difficult times. Indeed, it hasn't been easy, but for your support, we have come this far. And for that, we are grateful. Mr. Speaker, I also like to use this opportunity to thank all those who participated in the domestic debt exchange. We are grateful to you for your support. Mr. Speaker, I believe that this is one of the processes that will get us out of where we are to a safe landing zone where we can all work together to bring our economy back on track. Mr. Speaker, before I continue, I just want to put out there some impressions that have been created that is not true. Mr. Speaker, on the 3rd of February 2022, we met the majority side and members of um, Parliament, the, the parliamentary service, parliamentary service um, staff. And in that meeting, we mentioned, we actually said that we would want um, Parliament to give the Minister of Finance an opportunity to come over here and then explain the debt exchange to us. So um, if we stand here and say that we never did anything like that and that the minister was called here. Mr. Speaker, on the 7th of February, if you remember, I even mentioned it. Mr. Speaker, on the 7th of February, the first day that this house mentioned that we mentioned it on the 3rd of February when we met Parliament and the um, um, government business. And so we are waiting for um, the, the, um, the Speaker to give us a date. So, Mr. Speaker, this is something that has been on the table. We are waiting for the appropriate time to do that. And we are grateful that you've given us the opportunity to do that today. Mr. Speaker, secondly, I also want to put it out there that um, an impression has been created that um, government is, um, is taking away people's money. Mr. Speaker, 
we have a situation on our hands. Government is saying that I cannot continue um, um, with the bonds that I have taken from you. I cannot continue to um, disperse or to uh, redeem it as it is. Because of where we are now, our debt levels have become unsustainable. Everything about it. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, anytime you mention our debts, our, 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 our brothers on the other side fumble. This are debts that we got right from, right from the first day Ghana borrowed to date. This is not an MPP debt. This is a national debt, a national debt that was created from the first day Ghana decided to borrow to date. So let's get that clear, that it is not an MPP debt. This is a national debt that we have borrowed right from the time Ghana came into being, and Ghana needed to borrow money to date. Mr. Speaker, last year, we were paying our debts, we were servicing our debts, until things started getting difficult. Things started getting difficult, not as a result of um, only domestic issues, but also external issues. So it became difficult, and we were using about 70% of our tax revenue to service interest payments alone. Government says, I cannot continue like that. I have to do something about it. And we believe that with the support that we have enjoyed so far, we can move to the next stage. I just want to put on record, Mr. Speaker, um, to explain that the debt exchange, the domestic debt exchange, are in three categories. The first one is the category A, where we have people below 59 years. Government is saying, you will get your principal. You will get a coupon of 10% and that I am bring, initially when we, met, uh, we came out with a debt exchange, we had wanted to pay it within 12 years. Upon consultation with several members, government said, I am bringing it to five years. For those 59, below 59 years, it is going to be 10%. You are going to get your coupon at 10%. And by five years time, you should get your whole amount. That's the whole principle. So Mr. Speaker, nobody is taking away anybody's money. And when you come to the category B, Mr. Speaker, these are people 59 years and above. We agree with the sentiments that have been raised. And government effectively, effectively looking at the 12 years of the various bonds that we had, it was going to, um, the effective interest rate was going to be about 18.5%. Government says, looking at what the, the situation where I find myself now, the 18.5% is going to be difficult for me to pay. But I want to redeem the coupons for you. So I am giving 15%. I am giving 15% instead of the 18.5%. So yes, we understand you have sacrificed about 3.5. And we really appreciate that, our, 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 our pensioners. We really appreciate the sacrifice you have made for us. And we are grateful for that. So Mr. Speaker, it is 15%. And that 15% to government is saying, within five years, within five years, you can have your principal. Mr. Speaker, if for any reason, for anybody who signed on the domestic debt exchange, if for any reason you want your money, something has come up, there's an emergency, you want your money, with this debt exchange, you can go on and redeem, get your, uh, your principal and the coupon dues. Mr. Speaker, in the third category, we have any other person that does not fall between category A or B. So these are the banks. And thankfully, we saw some 6% participation in the category A, which is um, below 59 years. And for category B, our pensioners, we saw about 0.43% participation. And for the category C, which is the banks, the insurance, and all those, about 78.4% participation in that. Mr. Speaker, it is something that we need to move to the next level. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, there are three outstanding revenue measures that we believe that if we should pass, will also help us reach an agreement come March. So we are pleading with the House that the income tax bill, <coughs> the income, income tax bill, the growth and sustainability bill, as well as the excise, the amendment of the excise duty tax. And we are asking that you support us pass these three revenue measures as well to complement the debt exchange the debt exchange that we have done to help us reach an agreement with the with um, the IMF. Mr. Speaker, with this opening, we believe that we can also go ahead and engage our external borrowers and make sure they also come on board. Because, Mr. Speaker, this is something that we believe we must do to help our economy move from where we are now to a place where we all can feel comfortable, inflation rates can drop, the market will start members, improving. First Deputy Speaker to take the chair.
Yes, so yeah, Mr. Speaker, we believe that with the successful um, implementation of the domestic debt exchange, it will open the opportunity for us to engage our external partners and for them to come on board so that we can move from where we are to a place where we can help bring inflation down, bring food prices down, and the economy starts working again. Mr. Speaker, government spent billions of cities to restructure the financial sector. This same government will not see to it that the financial sector collapses. That is why government is doing everything possible to make sure that even in the midst of what, where we find ourselves, it will support the financial sector as well. So, Mr. Speaker, we thank um, uh, our colleagues on the other side. We thank our pensioners. We thank the people of Ghana. And we ask that they continue to support Ghana and um, this government to make sure we move Ghana to the next level. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, so this person is Samuel Opilito Nakwa. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, today is a terribly sad day for our country. A country which had so much prospects. First black nation to attain independence, the shining black star of Africa. We used to be the poster child of economic growth, of democracy. This was a country that many other African nations were asked to emulate. Today, all of those have been eroded. We are at the precipice. We are on the brink of economic catastrophe, of Armageddon of a cataclysmic economic disaster because of a finance minister who has betrayed the trust of the Ghanaian people. Mr. Speaker, what is even so obnoxious and irritating is the minister's opening remarks that this is a time to rejoice in the law. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rejoice in the law. The minister forgets that in Proverbs chapter 29 verse 2, the Bible says that when the wicked rule, the people mourn, the people groan, there is pain and there is anxiety when the wicked rule. Proverbs 29 2. This is us. If the minister is still rejoicing, then our problem is bigger than I ever imagined. Because it tells us that the, pres that the president, his vice president, his finance minister, they are in a bubble. They are totally out of touch. They are in a world of their own. And they are still in a rejoicing mood. They can come to parliament and tell us to join them to rejoice in the Lord at a time that senior citizens, the aged, the vulnerable, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said that the true measure of any society is how that society takes care of the vulnerable. People who have served this country with distinction, they did not join their colleagues who left for greener, they stayed here to reconstruct this nation. They toil, they sacrifice for decades. Their pensions are being taken away from them. Pensioner board holders. They have to picket days on end. 
and the president has not even invited them to listen to them. You have distinguished illustrious sons and daughters of this country, our role models, people we look up to. What would the younger generation say when they see those images? A whole former Chief Justice, Piketty. And let me salute the former Chief Justice and her colleagues that despite their old age, despite their frailty, they have decided to stand up to be counted. And Mr. Speaker, what is even so annoying when the finance minister met them, the finance minister, all he had to tell them was that you are actually doing and you are saying how? How is this? Taking people's money from them, people's hard-earned investments, their life savings, and then you add insult to injury. Apart from rejoicing, quoting wrong scriptures, scriptures that don't align with the times, you are adding Boaminamin Boao. Let the records reflect that what the minister is actually doing is Boaminamin Siu. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, all the things we have heard today from the finance minister is what the former Chief Justice, the Venerable Sofia Kufu, calls dubious explanations. All royalties paid to her. Dubious explanations. This finance minister is still blaming Russia Ukraine war, so called exogenous factors. Why is it that we are the only country in Africa currently going through a debt restructuring program? Why? The only country going through a domestic debt restructuring program. Why? Russia, Ukraine didn't affect Nigeria, didn't affect Senegal, didn't affect Cameroon, it didn't affect Togo, Benin. So we have a finance minister who even refuses to take responsibility. What I expected, and let the records reflect, Mr. Speaker, that it is those of us on this side who fought and got the minister to come here today. He didn't come on his own volition. He will have gone ahead with this program without the input of parliament, without the approval of parliament. I raised this matter and made an application, an urgent application before the speaker. But Mr. Speaker, what is even more troubling is that instead of this finance minister to come to parliament today and read a resignation speech, he has come here to offer dubious explanations. The Honourable Member, is the Speaker to take the chair. Yes, Honourable Member, two minutes. Two, two. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, when you read the literature on this debt exchange program, the Jamaican model has been presented as a goal. And a few countries who are unfortunate, unlucky, who are doomed like Ghana is today, are asked to adopt the Jamaican model. What did the, the Jamaicans do? Mr. Speaker, immediately they ran their country. The Prime Minister of Jamaica in 2011, Prime Minister Bruce Oret Golden, resigned. The Finance Minister resigned. The Governor of the Central Bank of Jamaica resigned. Mr. Speaker, that governor was called Derek Latimberdi. Bran Whitner took over from him. What the Jamaicans also did is that they collapsed 40 public institutions. 40. In Ghana, the president is still making appointments, elevating people to ministers of state, increasing the size of government. Mr. Speaker, the records of this house rather show that between last year and this year, Government expenditure has gone up by 82 billion Ghana cities. Can you believe that? At a time, you are taking pensioners' money. 
taking individual bondholders when you promise them that there will be no haircut. Honorable member, your time is up. Just 10 seconds, Mr. Speaker. The Jamaican model is important. I, I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up. The, the Jamaicans also established an economic program oversight committee, which included local business community, labor unions, CSOs, MPs, government officials to oversight. They also implemented a fiscal responsibility law to make sure that debt to GDP does not exceed 60%. And they sought parliamentary approval for all of this. They carried the people along. The finance minister has deviated from this gold standard. And this finance minister must go. I support for a resolution by this house that the pensioners, bondholders, the individual bondholders should be exempted from this draconian can Ophoriata inflicted, Dr. Baumia inflicted, President Nana Dodanko Akufado inflicted debt exchange program. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honourable members, it's now the turn of the Honourable Stephen Amwa. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity given me. Honorable member, don't be intimidated by the fact that you are before them. Go ahead. Thank you. That is why you always be my biological father. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, before I speak, <laughs> sorry, is it wrong? Okay. Mr. Speaker, before I proceed, before, sorry, before I proceed, I would like to honestly let our fathers, our grandfathers and mothers and the bondholders who are being confronted with this unpalatable but an inevitable fiscal policy that we as a country have to implement. I would like to say that we empathize with them. The hardship confronting us as a country, it was first done credibly even in the 2023 budget statement that the President, His Excellency Nanado Danko Ekufuadu, through the budget statement by the finance minister, demonstrated tremendous amount of empathy. So we like to let them understand that one day we are all going to grow to become retirees and pensioners. And it is not anything that we are all happy with. But I would like to give this scenario. If you have a child that has been diagnosed by a medical doctor, and has prescribed a particular medicine. The medicine might, in the short term, give some sort of uncomfortable situation, such as vomiting and others. But without the medicine, you lose the child. This is where we find ourselves in. This is not a time to adopt political gimmicks because we want power. This is not a time to demonstrate high level of unconscious incompetence simply because we do not understand the situation. It is very bad. Nobody is happy with what is happening. My government, the president, finance minister, all of us, even my brothers from the other side, they know that the situation we find ourselves in today, one of the best fiscal reforms is to adopt exchange of bonds with high debt with the low ones. It happened in Jamaica, it happened in Uruguay, it happened in UK in the 80s, it happened in Greece, it happened in Argentina. So this is a global policy. And I think we need to correct this. Mr. Speaker, this minister saying we should give thanks to God doesn't mean that he's happy with the situation. First Thessalonians, 
15, 16 to 18, the Bible states emphatically without any ambiguity that in all circumstances we should give thanks, should give thanks to God and that is the will of God for his children. So our fathers and mothers, it's not that finance minister is happy about what is happening. But finance minister believes in God. We all believe in God. And that God says that whether we are going through pain or pleasure, we should give thanks to God. It doesn't mean he's not happy with it. Me, 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 Mr. Speaker, I want people to understand why, what has happened, why they do this. We need to explain to people. There is hold up. When we say hold up, it means the issuer, which is the government, is not in the position to perform its obligation of paying what he owes. It is something we are all not happy with it. How did we get here? We got here because we are having high interest rate payments. It started from 2012. It increased to 2016. It started reducing up to 2018-19. Then we had this global crisis that put up an uncontrollable situation. Said that for about 21 months, we are going to impaired productivity in our country. We are not going to work, but we are being paid. The private sector had to serve over 40,000 people. Paying corporate taxes. We had shortfalls, revenue generation, over 12 billion. The only way government could perform its statutory obligation was to resort to debt financing because revenue generation domestically was an uncontrollable situation. And what do we do today? Do we continue to allow Ghana to get destroyed because of politics? How we got here? Have you forgotten that we're in the same house? Because of the challenges, we are fashioning out the reforms, such as revenue generation. But because of the seemingly balance that we have, there was disagreement that eroded the confidence of the investors and that put us in a situation where we could not even access private sector to perform over 10 billion a year import bills. We all contributed to this apart from the global. So what we are telling our fathers and mothers today is that we beg them the situation where we are is an inevitable play, uh, policy that we need to adopt. What we can assure them with is that Jamaica did, and at a point the same new bonds, their yield began to increase, the market began to do well, they were able to reduce their interest payment, and they went back to the international market, and Jamaica got well. I can assure them, yes, if they will be patient with us, there were a few challenges in, in rolling out the implementation. We are sorry, but I'm telling them today, as good managers of this economy, if they will agree with us and, and accept what we are doing today, in the near future, in the long term, they will be happy with this government. But the politics and the propaganda, other people in the name of securing political capital, will not benefit this country. I want to tell them that government is not sleeping. On the side of the government, we are cutting 30% emolument for the executives. We are reducing fuel by 50%. We are taking away almost all the irrelevant projects, making sure that the fiscal space that is causing all these problems, we can consolidate it. So, Mr. Speaker, all that we are saying today is that, yes, some of the points raised by my brothers from the NDC, I agree with them perfectly. No, we don't consider why we are here. When somebody is dying, if there's a convulsion, your child is going through convulsion, you don't ask how he got there. You find solution to that. And one of the solutions we want to find as a government today is to make sure that we put in place measures and policies that going forward, whenever there is global crisis, this very country of ours, going through the sinusoidal performance of our economy and other things, we can handle them well. Mr. Speaker, I don't want to... But I want to say, sorry, I don't. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what I can assure my brothers from the other side that they are doing well, putting the government on our feet, but they should also do well this time and think of how this country, as a result of Collectivism. Honourable Member, your, your, your time is up. Your time is up. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much.
Honourable members, we now listen to Honourable Eric Opoku. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, typical of the finance minister, he began the statement with a quotation from the Bible. And I would like to do the same thing. Mr. Speaker, first Kings, chapter 12, verse 6. Solomon once sought the expertise of old men who helped him make important decisions about the kingdom of Israel. But Mr. Speaker, he did not touch the livelihood of these old men. He sought their expertise, but never touched the livelihood of these people. Mr. Speaker, every policy, every policy has traced Listening to the minister, I was trying to see if I can understand the three key elements in the policy. The first one was the definition of the problem. The minister attributed everything to external factors. Mr. Speaker, we are where we are because of their unbridled borrowing for consumption. Mr. Speaker, when he took over, the total debt stock of our nation was 120 billion, as reported by Bank of Ghana. Today, you are here reporting that our debt within six years has ballooned to 575 billion Ghana cities, indicating that within six years, you have added 455 billion to the national debt stock. What did you use that money for? You are an investment banker. You know that when you borrow, you are expending future revenues and you pay in future. How did you invest the resources? Today, we have been asked to repay and we can't get the money to pay just because you borrowed for consumption. So, Mr. Speaker, we are in this morass, this economic quagmire, just because the government decided to borrow for consumption as if the world was coming to an end. That is the problem. If you don't have a better appreciation of the problem, there is no way you can prefer solutions. So if you continue to attribute it to Ukraine, Russia, to COVID, then there is no way you can solve the problem. Let's understand. Let Ghanaians understand that you have created the problem. And that from today, if you intend to borrow again, you will borrow for investment and not for consumption. In that case, we can have some confidence that the minister is now on the proper track to achieve the target set for himself. Mr. Speaker, the second point is the goal. What is the minister seeking to achieve with this policy? The minister is seeking to achieve fiscal space to grow the economy so that we can have resources to pay our loans. Mr. Speaker, now you are postponing payment of debt. You owe people you are saying that I cannot pay you today. I'm postponing the payment so that I can have space to borrow more. How then are you going to pay? If you want to have fiscal space to grow the economy, borrow it today. And before you borrow, you have been given a conditionality. Go and reduce your debt from the 100.3% of GDP to 55%. And just because of that, what you are saying is that no, I cannot pay you today. I'm pushing it up to 2037. After 2037, I'm going to borrow again, invest that money to grow the economy so that I'll be in the capacity to pay my, task, my, my debts. How can you do that, Mr. Speaker? So the goal is not achievable. And then, Mr. Speaker, what instrument is the minister seeking to use to address the challenge? He wants to fall on the savings of the agent, our mothers and fathers who have contributed their quota to the state. And as we speak, they don't have anything to live on except the little that they have saved. The minister is saying that without the savings of these people, Ghana cannot get out of the trouble. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, we are already in the mess. We are already in the mess. Banks are facing liquidity challenges. 
because they depended on the deposit of their customers from which they bought the bonds and the bonds are not being earned now. So when you go there, credits have dried up. Mr. Speaker, as you speak, prices of goods and services have passed the atmosphere. They have got into the stratosphere. Everybody is complaining everywhere. Employment is skyrocketing. Living conditions are very hard. Everybody in this country is suffering. What about those who don't have any means of survival except the little savings they have made for themselves? Mr. Speaker, it is unfortunate that under the watch of this government, they promise giving one constituency one million dollars every year. And just because of this, they establish authorities. Authorities to ensure that these funds are utilized in the best interest of Ghanaians. The funds were never disbursed, but the authorities are there, taking monies from the taxpayers to pay them and to service their offices. Mr. Speaker, if you want to reduce government expenditure, you can shrink the government, reduce the size of uh, the, the ministers, reduce the size of government, collapse institutions, irrelevant institutions. You have Minister of Trade, you have the experts there, they are ready to work for us. You have established one district, one factory secretariat, doing what? You have ministers all over, ministers without portfolio, many of them are the presidency. What are they doing? Shrink the government. Mr. Speaker, what is important for all to understand today, that it is not about our retirees alone, it's not about the pensioners alone, we are all at risk. The Auditor General, in its 2021 report, has reported to this House, under paragraph 239, that even this government, our SNIP contributions, the contributions that government workers have paid for SNIT has not been paid to SNIT. And government, as we speak, is owing SNIT to the tune of 4.33 billion Ghana cities. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance succeeded in convincing SNIT to accept bond valued at 1 billion as part payment of the debt. And today you are saying that you are not going to pay for the bond. You are postponing payment. So what happens to people who go on pension? So it is going to affect all of us. Don't forget that we pass a law and that which 5% of our state contributions is given to fund managers to manage. These fund managers, including enterprise, 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 these fund managers have invested these monies in bonds, anticipating that the bonds will be earned and they will get interest and then when people retire, they will have their monies. Today, the minister is reporting to this house that such bonds cannot be earned. So all of us, all government workers, wherever you are located, it is not a fight for the agent alone. It is a fight for all of us. Yes. Mr. Speaker, this thing must not be allowed to happen in this country. In fact, I am even confused. I have been asking simple, simple questions. Now you are saying that you don't have the money. You cannot pay your interest. So you are pushing it up. 2027, what do you have in the pipeline to pay for this money in 2027? What investment have you made? In 2027, where are you going to get the money from? It is just because of political expediency. You know you just have two years. You have just two years in office. So within the two years, you are pushing all the debt beyond two years so that you leave the scene. And whoever succeeds, you will come and show that the mess that you have created. This thing must not be allowed to happen. Mr. Speaker, the minister ought to have resigned long ago. The minister for finance ought to have resigned long ago. Our, our colleagues, on the other hand, they share this view with us. They agree with us that they is messing up the economy. It is because of his relationship with Mr. President that he is still in office. And he continues to destroy the foundations of this economy. So Ghanaians must rise up. We must rise up against the incompetence, the recklessness of the Honorable Minister of Finance. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Honorable, Honorable Member, your time is up. Mr. Speaker, yeah, yeah. on this note, on this note, 
I thank you very much. I thank you very much. And then conclude that the minister will never be forgiven. He will never be forgiven for destroying the economy of this country and impairing the lives of even children yet unborn in this country. Posterity will never forgive him. He should resign today. He should resign today. Honorable member. Honorable member. Honorable Eric Opoku, I heard you quote the Bible. But this is your last statement. It's not biblical at all. I say, I say your last Mr. statement. Your last yes, statement. Mr. Speaker, there is forgiveness, but in the judgment day, no one will be forgiven. <laughs> Honorable members, it's the turn of the Honorable Ajapa Mesa. Honorable Ajapa Mesa. Thank you, Raj Rabu, Speaker, for the opportunity oh, yes. to contribute to the statement ably made by the Minister responsible for Finance. Speaker, I must commend the Minister for, for attending upon the House to deliver this message that clearly puts in context where we are coming from and what has necessitated the need for him to go through this program and obviously steps that he's taking going forward to ensure that we bring our economy back onto its feet. Speaker, I must, before I even begin my contribution, indicate my strongest empathy towards uh, elders and senior citizens who have appeared before Parliament today obviously following from their initial picketing at the Ministry of Finance in the course of the week. Uh, indeed, taking a step back and listening to the commentary, the narrative in the public space, it seems to me, Mr. Speaker, respectfully, that the honest intent of the Finance Minister to provide especially the, the senior citizen pensioner bondholders an opportunity to also consider and if possible participate in the debt exchange program has clearly been misconstrued but mr speaker it's not surprising to me because um, with my past experience as a banker i i know that uh, what the finance minister is seeking to do really uh, having regard to how bonds work, is that you purchase the instrument for a fixed tenure. What that means is that you are not entitled ordinarily to redeem that bond until it matures. However, there is a secondary market where if for some emergency you are unable to wait for the maturity of the bond, then you can go to that secondary market to discount. Now, a huge chunk of the domestic debt was being exchanged under the program. What that meant, Mr. Speaker, was that there was going to be a limited market for old bonds that had not been exchanged to participate in the new bond. Clearly, that would pose some disadvantage to people who are holding on to the old bonds. And so the finance minister went against his own commitment to exclude the pension, I mean the retirees and individual bondholders, to afford them an opportunity to participate in this new bond so that they can have the flexibility of trading it on the secondary market. Mr. Speaker, that is exactly uh, honorable, honorable what the member, finance minister sought to uh, honorable do. Honorable member, yes, yes a minute. Honorable members, in view of the nature of business before the house are direct 
that certain be held outside the prescribed period. That is at two o'clock. So please, you may continue. Uh, speaker, that was exactly what the finance minister sought to do by opening up an opportunity for pensioners or individual bondholders to auto participate in the debt exchange program. Uh, speaker, but I'm not surprised about the responses that we are getting from largely the general public and indeed from our friends on the other side because clearly they see an opportunity to, as it were, even listening to the comments that has transitioned into a debate from what the finance minister presented, clearly want to play politics with the circumstances that we find ourselves in today. Mr. Speaker, I hear words like the finance minister should not touch pensioners, uh, he should not take away people's money from them. Why, why is he doing this to our pensioners? Whipping up sentiments clearly and taking away the focus from what the reality and the issues are. And speaker, uh, with all due respect to my colleagues on the other side, we should not lose sight of the context within which, as a country, we find ourselves here today. I hear my friends on the other side making a call on the finance minister to resign. But we forget that we, as a house, approved all the deficit limits for the finance minister to go and fund the deficit that we had approved for him in this house. Yet, we make it look as if the finance minister, without recourse to parliament, goes out there and takes these obligations for which he solely ought to be held responsible. But clearly, this is a collective responsibility. And Mr. Speaker, we did not approve we did not approve those limits for the finance minister to go out there and contract these funding budgets. Not for nothing. There was a basis for this House approving the budgets that the finance minister has consistently sought to implement for the benefit of the good people of this country. So, Speaker, if you look between 2017 and 2019, Honorable Akut Okudieto made references to Ghana being touted as the poster child of Africa. Indeed, it was true. We all witnessed those comments from the global community. So what happened post-2019 is a matter that ought to agitate all of us mind. That we were faced with a global pandemic which was not known to anybody and so we had to react in a certain manner to protect lives and livelihoods. Indeed, and in fact, I hear my colleagues on the other side make references to uh, every time you are using COVID-19 and Russia and Ukraine as excuses. Why are, why are other countries in Africa not suffering the same fate? Speaker, we conveniently forget that not many African countries, apart from Ghana, had energy sector bills that needed to be paid for. We conveniently forget that not every African country had a banking sector crisis that the IMF had identified as far back as 2014, that the assets were toxic and needed to be cleaned up. We conveniently forget that all these bills that the finance minister had to contract and pay for were unique to Ghana and not every other African country. And so, obviously, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian-Ukraine war is obviously going to be different from what other African countries would suffer. These are the facts. But Mr. Speaker, as the Deputy Finance Minister Abina Osiasari indicated, we are where we are and we need to make progress. As a country, it is important for us to look at what the issues are and to make a determination whether indeed the course of action that the Finance Minister has taken or proposes to take, indeed the debt exchange, is now closed and he's indicating that there are some further steps that he's going to take to ensure that we have a successful IMF program. The question that we ought to ask ourselves is, do we not have to give the finance minister the requisite support that he needs to ensure that he goes through a successful IMF program to help resuscitate the economy for the benefit of all of us? 
I believe, Mr. Speaker, strongly that that is the focus that this House ought to be paying attention to. Indeed, if you look at the statement, especially in paragraphs 9, 11, 17, the Finance Minister provides a clear context why he took the decision to go through pro this program. He's provided responses with respect to what it is that he has done, the context of the debt exchange programs in paragraph 25 through to 33, and the steps that he's taking to ensure that we bring back our economy uh, into a situation that the Ghanaian people would benefit to the pre-COVID environment where Ghana was indeed touted as a poster board. And I'll urge all of us to throw our weight behind the finance minister and encourage him rather than condemn him so that he can work hard together with his team to bring our economy back on track. I thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you so much. I added one minute to your time. Yes, uh, it's now the turn of Honorable Muhammad Ayarga. Thank you very much. Uh, Right Honourable Speaker, Right Honourable Speaker, if this House recollects when we discussed the business of the week, we on this side, led by Honourable Ablakwa, drew attention to the absence of an arrangement for the Finance Minister to appear before this House on the issue of the domestic debt exchange. So, Speaker, I added my voice to that call by reiterating that indeed something even more fundamental was at stake. And that fundamental issue was the very legality of the conduct of the finance minister. Is the conduct of the finance minister on his own, without the authorization of this parliament, to go and renegotiate terms and conditions of loans that he had entered into with bondholders and vary it to their detriment, whether or not that was legal. Mr. Speaker, that for me is the fundamental issue. It is not about exempting any particular category. It is whether or not our finance minister has legal authority to do what he is doing. And I want to demonstrate to the finance minister in my comment that he has no legal authority to go and renegotiate any loan without the approval of this house. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the Constitution of Ghana in Article 181, Clause 3, says that no loan shall be raised by the government on behalf of itself or any other public institution or authority otherwise than by or under the authority of an Act of Parliament. And then four says that an Act of Parliament enacted in accordance with Clause 3 of this article shall, Mr. Speaker, shall provide that the terms and conditions of a loan shall be laid before Parliament and shall do operation unless they have been approved by a resolution of Parliament. Mr. Speaker, a loan is defined by clause 6, and it says, for the purpose of this article, loan includes any monies lent or given to or by the government on condition of return or repayment and any other form of borrowing or lending in respect of which paid from the consolidated funds. Mr. Speaker, Debt securities, securities issued by the government, are undoubtedly loans. They are loans. Whether you are contracting the loan from an individual pensioner, or you are contracting it from a bank, or you are contracting it from the international financial markets, Mr. Speaker, it is a loan. And the law is clear that that loan, the terms, cannot and must be approved by this parliament. So, Speaker, the Public Financial Management Act then goes ahead to make the enactment that is required in Article 18.1.4. And it provides, Mr. Speaker, government borrowing and debt management. That is the Public Financial
Financial Management Act 2016, Act 921, Section 55. It says that subject to Article 181 of the Constitution and this Act, the Minister has the authority to raise a loan on behalf of the government, both within and outside the country, and in local or foreign currency, subject to Article 181. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Section 56 of the Act provides that the terms and conditions of all government borrowings, all the terms and conditions of all government borrowings shall be laid before Parliament and shall not come into operation unless the terms and conditions are approved by a resolution of Parliament in accordance with Article 181 of the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Loans Act was repealed. Mr. Speaker, if you don't know, this Public Financial Management Act repealed the Loans Act. I have read the Loans Act as far back as when I was a law student. Mr. Speaker, it is obvious, it is obvious that all forms of public borrowings must be approved by this House. And so changing the terms and conditions must equally be approved by this House. It must be approved by this House. So the Minister of Finance cannot be a law unto himself and be running wrecks on the lives of innocent people by changing the terms and conditions of a loan that they have contracted with the government of Ghana. Mr. Speaker, this is what is in issue today. This Parliament is being called upon to stand on the side of our citizens yeah, yeah. because they elected the president to manage their welfare and they elected us to protect them from the same president. Yeah, yeah. That is our constitutional arrangement. It is not about exempting just the pensioners. It's about ensuring that the finance minister is accountable to the people through this parliament by bringing whatever he has negotiated with the bondholders to this house so that we will be the ultimate deciders of whether it is acceptable. He cannot enforce the changes. It is unconstitutional. It is illegal. It is inappropriate. And that is what is an issue. Mr. Speaker, again, in one of the statements, after he had borrowed from the banks and rendered the banks penniless, he now tells the banks that they should go to Ghana Amalgamated Trust PLC so that they will be assisted with some funding from the Ghana Financial Stability Fund. Mr. Speaker, again, you ask the Finance Minister, who is GATT? Which law established GATT? Is GATT a public entity? And why will he imperil banks and not direct them to go to GATT, a private entity, and go and seek assistance? And the whose authority is he doing this? His own authority? Mr. Speaker, there is a parliament. And all of us sitting here are members of this parliament. And we must not allow something like this to happen. Mr. Speaker, he announces the Ghana Financial Stability Fund. He should tell us under which act he is establishing a Ghana Financial Stability Act. And he announces funding to be given to the Ghana Financial Stability Act. He should tell us his source of revenue and who authorized him as finance minister to release money under the name of a Ghana Financial Stability Fund to assist the banks. Mr. Speaker, if it is public fund, he must come here and get his approval. And he hasn't come here for any approval. Mr. Speaker, this finance minister has become a law unto himself. Mm -hmm. And this parliament must sit up. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Mr. Speaker, the taxpayers who queue every four years to vote us have been wasting their time. Mr. Speaker, we have been elected, all of you, on all sides, so that on this day, a day like this, when the executive, when the executive is trampling on the rights of ordinary citizens, we will stand to be counted. We will stand to be counted. Mr. Speaker, this parliament cannot accept what has happened. All that the finance minister has done is illegal, is unacceptable. And if he doesn't bring it here for approval, Mr. Speaker, we will not allow it to stand. We will go to every institution under the, and every institution under this constitution to make sure that we block what the finance minister has done. We must defend the bondholders. We must defend the pensioners. We must defend the owners of the banks. 
we must defend anybody who has given some confidence, invested confidence in the government of Ghana, of which we are all part, and lend his money to the government. We must defend them today. If we don't defend them, then we are all wasted, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am one of those who demanded that the finance minister should be here, and it is because of this important constitutional Honorable matter. Your, your time is up. So, Mr. Speaker, in concluding, my basic comment is, Mr. Finance Minister, everything that you have done is inconsistent with the Public Financial Management Act, which vests it is inconsistent with the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. It is illegal. It is not fair. It is not right. You can't do it. Please stop what you are doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honorable members, it is the turn of Honorable John Kuma. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you very much. And I want to bring to the attention of the House the good news that the Finance Minister has brought to us today. That the debt, domestic debt exchange program has ended successfully for Ghana and we exceeded the target of 80% and actually got 84.9%. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, that can only be said in gratitude to the nation, especially to stakeholders, Parliament of Ghana, Council of State, uh, the pension funds, organized labor, Ghana Association of Bankers, and individual bondholders. Mr. Speaker, this achievement has come at a huge sacrifice, but we have proven once again that we are a nation of patriots and full of nationalism, and we will rise to preserve Ghana on any day in any difficult times. Yeah. And this is what the report is talking about. Mr. Speaker, we have been asked by our friends on the other side that how did we get here? And one friend said, Ghana used to be a poster child of economic growth. That achievement was done by the Honorable Ken Oforiata. In 2017, 2018, 2019, Ghana achieved one of the fastest economic growth in the world. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, not in Africa, in the world. Yeah. We are where we are today because of misfortune. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, in 2020, COVID struck Ghana. The world. COVID struck the world. Yeah. Ghana is not an exception. And we, as we speak today, Mr. Speaker, my friend asks, is Ghana, why is Ghana the only country going through debt restructuring? Mr. Speaker, maybe our friends are not following globally what is happening. As we speak today, over 30 countries have run to the IMF for one support or the other. As we speak today, Zambia is before uh, 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 the world for debt restructuring. Ghana is before the world for debt restructuring restructuring. Egypt is also going through debt restructuring. And several other nations are going through debt restructuring. Yeah, so, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, the evidence of what we have done with the borrowing is in all the sectors of Ghana. Speak about education sector, health infrastructure, talk about energy, talk about security, our roles. Every aspect of our country is evident of what we did with the borrowing. Yes. But, Mr. Speaker, right. let me deal directly and give hope to our individual bondholders, especially our retirees today, on the accusation that the president promised there will be no haircut. Mr. Speaker, that is exactly what has happened in the announcement that the finance minister has made today. There has been no haircut in the successful execution of the domestic debt exchange program. Mr. Speaker, and it has remained voluntary from day one until now. There has been no haircut. All principles of all stakeholders have been maintained. Yes. Mr. Speaker, we have also been accused of flip-flopping, promising that there will be no individual bondholders taking part in the domestic debt exchange. Mr. Speaker, the same accusers forgot that initially we promised to include the pension funds. Mr. Mr. Speaker, in a democracy, you govern by engagement. Engagement came to the conclusion that we must rather replace pension funds with individual bondholders. And Mr. Speaker, we want to thank individual bondholders for their graciousness in coming on board to accept so that we can preserve pension funds and deal with it differently in these circumstances. So, Mr. Speaker, there's no flip-flopping. 
we have done exactly what we needed to do to achieve success for this country. And we are told that people resign in Jamaica. We should look at the Jamaica example. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the colleague, was Jamaica example caused by COVID? Has he read the circumstances that led to Jamaica's situation? He should not compare that to what is happening to our country and the world today. Mr. Speaker, I want to, I want to specifically address our grandfathers and our retirees who are here today in pain and requesting for a specific exemption and to assure them that that exemption has been granted unto them. Yeah. Yeah. Subsequent to all the engagements and picketing, in a letter dated 15th February 2023, addressed to, from the Ministry of Finance to the Pension Bondholders Forum, a reference Dr. Edu Enchi on their appeal for exemption for, from uh, pensioner board of bondholders from the DDEP. Paragraph 9, specifically, Mr. Speaker, paragraph 9 reads, from the foregoing and to allay any concerns expressed in the meeting today, government want to state categorically, categorically, that all pension bondholders who opted not to participate in the exercise are exempted. The word is exempted from the DDEP. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure them respectfully and respectfully and in all humility that if it is assurance they want, government has said it categorically, not just in words, also in writing, that all those who did not participate have been exempted. Mr. Speaker, why did some of them participate? Mr. Speaker, some of them participated, and I want to thank the gallant 1,340 individual retirees who took part in the DDEP program. Mr. Speaker, they took part because the record show that the offer government gave was very attractive. First of all, first of all, 80 percent, Mr. Speaker, and I mean 80 percent of category B, the retiree bondholders, had maturity over five years. It means some of them are waiting 10 years, 15 years, 18 years. Government says, government says, I have curtailed the maturity to five years. So on the fourth year, you can get 50% of your principal. On the fifth year, you get absolute 100% of your principal. Mr. Speaker, and the only sacrifice which we requested was that, Mr. Speaker, and let's be honest here, the sacrifice government then requested of them in the offer is that instead of the 18.5 or the average of let's say 19 percent we are going to give you 15 percent on your coupon so you were going to sacrifice four percent as your contribution to the debt exchange program mr speaker that even that is not compulsory mr speaker it is not compulsory it is optional now mr speaker it is optional. Government says you choose to pick it. Now, the 80 percent, Mr. Speaker, about 1,340 of the retirees said, okay, we will take advantage, uh, 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 take advantage of the five-year maturity period given to us. After all, we are still going to get our coupon rate of 15 percent. And the event, Mr. Speaker, most importantly, in the event that there is an emergency, which let's say a health condition, and I had to trade off the bond coupon that I have, there will be no market or there's less market attraction for the old bonds as compared to the new bonds. Because as we speak today, per the results, 80, almost 85% of all bonds have now been uh, 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 migrated into the new bond market. So there's a less bond market for the old market. That is not a government situation. It is a market determination that can affect the value of your bonds, Mr. Speaker. So this is why opportunity was offered. It is not to force anybody. It is not compulsory. And Mr. Speaker, they wanted the word exemption. We have put it in words, and I'm confirming it today. All those who did not participate, please rest assured, you are exempted. Your bonds will be paid, your coupons will be paid, and your principals will be paid. Honorable member. Your time, your, time no is up. your time is up. Your time for us to keep fighting. Your time is up. Oh, Mr. Speaker, so I, I, in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, I just want to, and to thank the minister 
and to thank all Ghanaians who participated in giving us a successful domestic debt exchange. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honorable members, we now listen to the Minority Leader, Honorable Atu Forsen. Mr. Speaker, uh, to start with, I can't find a finance minister. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, it is important that he's here to listen to our side of the debt exchange that is ongoing. Mr. Mr. Speaker, first, let me state that all what is happening was avoidable and still avoidable. Mr. Speaker, domestic debt exchange is like a surgery. You don't do it if you are not sure of its repercussions. Mr. Speaker, you only do it knowing very well that it will solve a problem. But unfortunately, what the Minister of Finance and the government is doing today will hurt the people of Ghana big time. Mr. Speaker, I say this for a simple reason that there's a good reason why no Africa country has ever restructured its domestic debt. There is a good reason why Ghana has never defaulted in the payment of domestic debt. Today, Ghana is the first country in the entire Africa ever to restructure its domestic debt. We are the first country, we are the, this is the first time we have defaulted in the payment, in the payment of our domestic debt. The speaker, yesterday, yesterday, Fitch downgraded Ghana to restrictive default. Simple put, we have defaulted in the payment of our domestic debt. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what surprises me is that instead of government addressing the concerns by burden sharing, they are engaging in burden shifting. Mr. Speaker, I say burden shifting for a simple reason that when you are confronted with this major economic catastrophe, you share the burden with your citizens. But what this government is doing is shifting the burden from the government to the ordinary Ghanaian. So, Speaker, by the time that this government is done with what they are doing, the insolvency we are seeing at the national level, the bankrupt Ghana, we will now see a bankrupt pensioners, bankrupt individuals, bankrupt banks. That is what this government is seeking to do. They are only transferring the bankruptcy from central government to individuals, unfortunately. Our country, as we speak, is bankrupt. Our country, as we speak, is simply insolvent. We cannot repay our debt. Simple put. Mr. Speaker, what will shock you is that this minister and the government is transferring the bankruptcy to pensioners. It's transferring the bankruptcy to individual bondholders. It is transferring this bankruptcy to rural banks transferring this bankruptcy to credit unions and the financial sector don't be surprised that by the time that they are done and dusted we will have to engage in banking sector cleanup once again because the speaker our banks are going to obviously collapse the speaker i have cited a bank of ghana report that says 17 banks are at risk as a result of what is happening 17 banks. And so I urge the minister to be careful in what he's doing, not to transfer the bankruptcy to the private sector. To continue on this part, to continue on this part, Mr. Speaker, I say this for a simple reason that what is happening is self-inflicted. One, Mr. Speaker, this government started in 2017 by engaging in unsustainable borrowings. We were sitting here Anytime the minister appears before us, he tells us that he's going for panda bond, sukuk bond, uh, 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 what do you call it, green bond, yellow bond, all sorts of bonds. You had to establish a whole unit responsible for bonds. A whole unit responsible for bonds. Today, this is your terminal report. This is your terminal report. Mr. Mr. Speaker, one time I called the minister of a rebond. Because all what he knows is to engage in borrowings. 
I once said that this government only knows about one problem, one loan. This is the terminal report. It's self-inflicted. And when we asked him to start dealing with the problems of Mr. Speaker, he refused. He told us yes, that he's not going to IMF. The Deputy Minister there, he said he's not going to IMF today, tomorrow, until the kingdom comes. Today you, you, are, you are there. Mr. Speaker, if they had gone to IMF earlier, all of this, we could have remedied it. Aside that, Mr. Speaker, after going to IMF, they said to us that they want to achieve staff level agreement in record times. Mr. Speaker, I can confirm to you today that our IMF program is poorly negotiated. Poorly negotiated, Mr. Speaker, and, and I show you the reason why I'm saying it's poorly negotiated. Mr. Speaker, another country that is in similar problem is Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has to go through debt restructuring. And what Sri Lanka has done is that they, are, they have agreed with the IMF to reduce their debt to GDP by 28% over a period of 10 years. 10 years from 2022 to 2032. Our minister responsible for finance, who led the negotiation, had agreed with the IMF to reduce our debt to GDP in present value terms from 103% of GDP to 55% of GDP within a period of six years. Mr. Speaker, simple put, Ghana seeks to reduce our debt to GDP by 45% plus in six years. As against Sri Lanka seeking to reduce this by 28% by 10 years. So Mr. Speaker, simple put for those of us who doesn't understand, this means that, this means that Ghana's adjustment is more harsh. It's harsher. So Speaker, it is harsh in the sense that, Mr. Speaker, if Ghana had negotiated this in a longer horizon, domestic bondholders, debt restructuring, particularly domestic, would have been avoided. That is why Sri Lanka is not doing domestic debt restructuring. That is why they are not doing domestic debt restructuring. Mr. Speaker, I repeat, our colleagues, the Minister of Finance who led our team to the IMF to negotiate, did a very bad job. They did a very bad job. So all of this was avoidable. All of this was avoidable. Today, we had to contend with a situation that even pensioners had to sacrifice part of their money. Mr. Speaker, I beg to say that what is happening in this country, time has come for us to put the bricks. Mr. Speaker, it is not for nothing that if you look at the public of Ghana, in Article 1993, Mr. Speaker, Pensioners, pension money is exempted for the payment of taxes. And the constitution is specific about this, that pension should not attract taxes. So speaker, the intention is clear. The intention is to protect our pensioners. Today, government of Ghana is engaging in a fiscal policy that seeks to take money from pension funds, particularly pensioners. But what surprises me, what surprises me, Mr. Speaker, is that whilst the minister intends to exempt, exempt future pensioners, he's, he's intended to tax or he's intended to engage, not to exempt people that are already on pension. What sort of economic policy is this? What sort of economic policy is this, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, you are exempting future pensioners. But current pensioners, you don't want to exempt them. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder, Mr. Speaker, no wonder, Mr. Speaker, that pensioners are picketed, are picketed at the Ministry of Finance. Mr. Speaker, two days ago, two days ago, 199, 1993. Mr. 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 Speaker, Mr. Speaker, not long ago, our ex-Chief Justice, Justice Sophia Ekufu, had to be part of the picket. And she said something very, very instructive. Mr. Speaker, some of the things she said, and I beg to read, Mr. Speaker, she said that, why are we in this mess? Nobody has fully explained to us. We took loans. 
what did we use the loans for? And where is the accountability? Exactly what was it used for? You government are not telling us about how we are going to be able to make things better. But you are saying, help me, and I help you. No, you help yourself first. Let me see if you are doing something seriously. Mr. Speaker, please. And Mr. Speaker, he went on to say that because we have seen this sort of things so many times. Mr. Speaker, she went on to say that I find this wicked. Mr. Speaker, I can agree with her. This is wicked. She went on to say that I find this disrespectful. Mr. Speaker, I agree with her. This is disrespectful. Mr. Speaker, she went on to say this is unlawful. Mr. Speaker, I agree with her. Mr. Minister, this is unlawful. Mr. Speaker, she went on to say that I find this totally wrong. Mr. Speaker, I can only agree with her. This is very wrong on your part, Mr. Minister. So she went on that 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 the last thing you should do, especially when you don't have any service that are specifically geared at the comfort and the, uh, and the relief of the age. Mr. Speaker, our former Chief Justice went on to say something very instructive and said that this is not Medofwa Dadami. She, she said, Medofu Edimewu. Medofu Edimewu. Medofu Edimewu. Medofu Asami. Mr. Speaker, and I agree with her because we cannot allow a country to be run the way it's being run. Mr. Speaker, I want to serve notice. I want to serve notice that based on Order 78 of our standing orders, that I wish to give notice, Mr. Speaker, that we, members of this House of the House, will file a motion to invite the House to pass a resolution directing the Minister responsible for finance to exempt individual bondholders and pensioners and pensioners from the domestic debt exchange. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I heard my colleagues say that they have exempted individual bondholders. Mr. Speaker, let him be aware that there is difference between self-exempt and issuer's exemption. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the rights are not the same. The rights are not the same. So don't think we don't know about this. Mr. Speaker, we will push for issuer's exemption for our dear pensioners. We will push for issuer's exemption for the ordinary bondholder. Mr. Speaker, because the Speaker, we will not allow for someone to engage in reckless borrowing, put the country into a bottomless pit, and then the ordinary person would take the heat out of this. Mr. Speaker, to conclude, to conclude on this matter, the Minister raised three critical points in his statement. In his statement, Mr. Speaker, one of them is that he said they will embark on fiscal consolidation, undertake debt operations, and secure financing assurance from development partners. Mr. Speaker, one of the things that is missing is the, is, is the fact that he is not engaging in fiscal consolidation. Mr. Speaker, clearly, clearly, not long ago, before, after he read the budget, the president obviously working for the government, has appointed two superior court judges, Supreme Court judges, in November 2022 alone. He went ahead to appoint 15 appeals court judges, 15 appeal court judges, and then 21 high court judges, all put together 38. This is a country that is engaging in fiscal consolidation. Mr. Speaker, I thought that he would use the opportunity to reshuffle the government and reduce the size of government, they are rather increasing it. They are rather increasing it. Mr. Speaker, is this a government that is engaging in fiscal control? Mr. Speaker, I don't see that. The budget statement does not point to a government that is engaging in fiscal consolidation. Please, please, we will not allow you to engage in burden shifting. We will share the burden with you. So we want to tell you that if you want us to pass your loans, pass your taxes, Cut first. Show us the way. Show us the way that you are ready to share the burden with the people of Ghana before you call on us to approve your taxes. We will allow you to shift the burden to the ordinary Ghanaian. And I serve notice now. Mr. Speaker, aside that, aside that, he went ahead and said in paragraph 29, paragraph 29, Mr. Speaker, I read, he said, Mr. Speaker, government is however mindful of the fact that 82.9 billion 
bonds that were successfully tendered represent 64% of the outstanding stock, which is 130 billion at the end of December 2022. So, Speaker, in one breath, they said that they were able to achieve 80% plus. In another breath, it is actually 64%. In, act, in, in another breath, it's actually 64%. So, who are you trying to deceive? Who are you trying to deceive? It's 64%. That is your success rate and not 80%. And take note, your own statement. Your own statement. Your own statement. Mr. Speaker, and finally, and finally, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, finally, our minister has said that the SLA required, among others, that the completion of comprehensive debt restructuring, covering domestic and external debt, in addition to fiscal consolidation efforts and other structural reforms. This is one of the fastest agreements for a country undertaking a debt restructuring. The Speaker, indeed, is one of the fastest, but it is the one that is mostly poorly negotiated because they rushed into it, didn't constitute proper and strong team to be able to negotiate with the IMF, and as a result, Ghana has had a bad deal. Mr. Speaker, may Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, honorable members, it's now the turn of the majority leader, the leader of the House, honorable Oseiche Mensa Bonsu. Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to the statement made in this house by the Minister responsible for Finance. But Mr. Speaker, just so that we do not mislead ourselves, I think the concluding statement from the Minority Leader should be further interrogated because it's mixing up facts. The Speaker, in paragraph 26 of what the Minister presented to us, he says, the Minister of Finance formally launched the domestic debt exchange on 5th December 2022, seeking to restructure about 137 billion Ghana cities worth of government bonds and notes. As of December 2022, the total outstanding debt, eligible and non-eligible holders, amounted to 137 billion. Subsequent extensions of the dates and payments of maturities meant that the remaining stock reduced from 137 billion to 130 billion. The speaker, you come to the next paragraph. However, the eligible ones as per the exchange memorandum meant an exclusion of pension funds and bonds that were subject to swap mechanisms for monetary and exchange rate policy operations. This then brought the eligible bonds for tendering to 97.7 billion. Speaker, if you don't read these things and you jump to conclusions, Speaker, you may injure yourself as he's injured himself. Mr. Speaker, so the, the, the minister, a former um, deputy minister for finance, now the minority leader, please speak to facts. Please speak to facts and don't jumble the facts. Otherwise, we get it wrong. Mr. Speaker, so that is it. Mr. Speaker, I, I heard the Arab minority leader before he began saying to us that the domestic debt exchange program is the single financial policy he has ever seen since his birth. Mr. Speaker, that might as well be true. But since the birth of the minority leader, has he ever heard of the invasion of a certain disease called coronavirus? Of ninth of 2019. Have, have you ever heard that? Since your birth, since your birth, have you ever heard that a president woke up one day and then decided to attack a sovereign nation? One morning. Have you ever heard that? And have you ever heard of the repercussions that is had on the world economy? Mr. Speaker, so let's be truthful to ourselves when we want to relate to this. Mr. Speaker, the borrowing crisis 
and he, he alludes to that. The speaker, the, it includes the banking crisis that this government came and solved. It includes the solution that we offered to the doomsday crisis. The speaker, fiscal space stripped away incrementally over time. Since we came, addressing the banking crisis, the aftershocks of the deal. So, the speaker, they pay, they take as we pay contracts that we came to meet. All these contributed. All these contributed. Yes, Mr. Speaker, people are laughing over that. Today, today, the energy that we generate in strong capacity is in the region of how much? You should know. You should know. What do we require for us? So, Mr. Speaker, how much are we paying for the excess capacity? It's not as if we will not require it maybe given 10 years. Certainly by 10 years we require it. Was it necessary to have done those constructions that we did um, eight years back? Was it? Was it necessary to have done what we did? Today, the optimum requirement for us is in the region of about three... Um, 3.2 kilo um, megawatts, 3.2 thousand, I should say, megawatts. His total capacity is close to 6,000. We have to pay. Who would, which investor would do that? If a private person would you do that, that's what we did. And this nation has to pay for it. Mr. Speaker, he, Anabu Adongo, told us that uh, the government debt is more riskier, I'm quoting him, uh, than lending to Adungu. That is well understood by him. It's more riskier. Government lending, borrowing is more riskier than lending to Adungu. It's only, you can only understand it. You only can understand that construction. Because that construction is not known to the, it the, is not the supposed king. to be risky. Let me assist in the king's language. But it is no. now riskier. Mr. Speaker, I do not know. You don't know why he's saying that. Because he used the word more and then riskier. <laughs> so he's combining the two. It doesn't exist in English. Right? Oh, oh, oh. So, this is English. 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 That MPP are the so, only property, you know, you know, property owning Democrats. You know, he, 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 he doesn't even read his constitution. If you read your constitution, Article 36, Article 36, Clause 7 will tell you that all of us, Ghana is a, is a property owning republic. Care to read? It is not MPP. Please, regardless of your socialist antecedents, that is what. The referendum was about, and all of us voted for the constitution of 1992. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the minority leader says that parliament has not approved of the domestic debt program. That, Mr. Speaker, there is, when we, are, when we approved of the, the budget statement and economic policy, the budget statement and economic policy that came to this house on November, Thursday, November 24, 2022, is the underpinning policy of government work program. Mr. Speaker, so once you approve of this, you've approved of the policy. I thought, I thought people should understand this. You don't understand that. And you're saying that it hasn't come to us. The paragraph that you quoted, the speaker and the paragraph 253 to 274. 253 to 274. Read it. It's contained there. And the debt operations are also covered under paragraph 275 to 280. All these are listed there. So what, they are the policy framework. So when you approve of this, if you read and understood, then you realize that you have approved of the economic policy. So when you come here, to say that we have been approved of the policy, then you do understand or pre perhaps appreciate what we were doing at the time. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the economy, 
has since 2017 not been in this state. Of course, all of us do know that the records of 2017, 2018, 2019 speak for themselves. We have lifted this economy to a plateau level. Mr. Speaker, from what existed in 2012, 2013, 2014, and as at the point of exit, 2016, we have plateauing. And you know that the difference is clear until, until the advent of COVID-19. And even after COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, look at the growth of GDP in 2021. The economy was bouncing back. It was bouncing back. Then entered 2022. And we find ourselves down again. We have to lift ourselves up. The Speaker, for now, when the finance visa appeared before us, he admits that these are, I'm quoting him, these are very challenging times. And the Speaker, he made that admission by, um, I'm quoting, I'm quoting paragraph 7 of, of the Minister's presentation to us. It says, I wish to express our profound appreciation to the people of Ghana for their patience and support throughout these challenging times. The Minister admits that these indeed are very challenging times. Mr. Speaker, the issues that you related to says, and I'm quoting page uh, paragraph 13 of his presentation, it says, the Speaker, through these and other decisive measures, government has managed and continues to pay compensation for all public sector workers. In some jurisdictions, in some countries, because of how the economies are suffering, some public servants, some civil servants have been laid off. It didn't happen in Ghana. The Minister te tells us, or reminds us, that we have kept the lights on. We have improved key infrastructure and maintained security despite the heightened and increasing risk. The Speaker, last year, here in Parliament, we're telling ourselves and urging the Minister responsible for defence and the Interior and the National Security Ministers that in spite of our predicament, they should not take our security for granted. And we approved of huge loans for them to protect this country. The Speaker, that is against all odds. Other countries that you are citing are not having those difficulties. That is what we should remind ourselves. We, should, we cannot afford to lower our guards, even in the face of leaders. Mr. Speaker, the minister then goes on, paragraph 14, that following these interventions, financing of government and liquidity on our domestic market has severely reduced an admission, an admission of the fact that, indeed, attributable to these factors. Financial space has shrunk for us, and we must be sympathizing with the Minister of Finance, where we are as a country. Mr. Speaker, the Minister then goes on to tell us that government undertook internal debt sustainability, which defined public debt to include public, publicly guaranteed debt of the central bank, partial non-guaranteed debt of state-owned enterprises, and expenditure arrears. This analysis revealed that public debt exceeded 100% of our GDP and the servicing accounted to for more than half of total government revenues and almost 70% of tax revenues. This is an open admission. The Speaker, these things have been existing all this while. These things have been existing all this while. Finance ministers have come to this house and rendered accounts to us, not including the desktop of state-owned enterprises. That is true. For the first time, the Speaker, we are including Esla Are we saying that Esla did not exist before 2017? They did exist. Hokobo debts, they existed before 2017. The Honorable Eric will bear testimony to that. Coco, Coco bought debts. They existed. We never included them. Rendering account. Now IMF is insisting that we should do that so that everything is straightening up. Mr. Speaker, as for those of them who are saying that, oh, the desktop has ballooned from 122 billion to, to 
uh, about 500 billion now. It is, uh, it is, it is admissible. One must admit it. Except, I keep saying, if you dollar rate it, if you dollar rate the, the debt as at the point you left, you realize that it's not very extraordinary. It's not the best, we must admit, but it's not very extraordinary. Because what you inherited, inherited the CDT dollar was 1.2 to 1 dollar. So when the, the debt stock increased to 122 at the point of exit, the speaker, when you do the calibration, you realize that at the time you were living, the debt stock was close to 42 billion dollars. Yes, when you do it, it was about 42 billion. Mr. Speaker, let's not kid ourselves. Let's not kid ourselves. So you see, don't attribute the debt stock alone to this administration if you want to do what is right. But we are where we are. We are where we are. How do we get out of it? How do we get out of it? The other day, when we met in this house, we were saying to ourselves that we should devise a scheme where the borrowings of any administration over a four-year period perhaps may not exceed a certain percentage of GDP. Is it the case that maybe you get to, if you agree on 55%, you get to 55%, and the next succeeding government, because it's 55 percent, will have a sound tied behind his back. You see, let's have a proper thing through. It's the reason why some of us have been urging that we should have a committee on the economy in-house to deal with some of these matters. So that together, for those of them who understand, I believe they will listen and understand. Those of them in the flank who don't understand can make noise. <laughs> the speaker. Mr. Speaker, so let's come to the realization that we are where we are, attributable not to one government, but it's a country, it's a country burden. How do we lift ourselves up? How do we lift ourselves up? So, Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I believe that the, the, when the minister said to us, paragraph 23, at the inception of the negotiation with the IMF, we agreed that Ghana would have to address its economic challenges on three folds. One is embarking on fiscal is embarking on fiscal consolidation. Two is undertaking debt operations and securing financial assurances from the development partners, which is what she has told to us. Mr. Speaker, the the issue about pensioners he has related to, and when we were on recess. They came to us, the minority leader, myself, and some other in the expanded leadership. I think the issue that they raised primarily was lack of engagement. See, maybe the communication was not the best. You must admit. Other than that, and I said that nothing can substitute for public engagement. Because if maybe we had done so earlier, perhaps all these Buhaha would not be cascading to the level that people are talking about. But we, the minister has spoken. On, on I will that your, your, time, your time is up. The speaker, let me leave on plus, time for a brief while. More than one minute. Finally, Mr. Speaker, just, just to reiterate the assurance given by the minister that the, the, the government will honor the coupon payments and maturing principles like all government bonds. The assurance, the assurance to, the, to them, for those of them who submit. In fact, we must admit that we are, we are in turbulent terms and it's voluntary. You go on board and there's some assurance that you will have a guaranteed payment of 15%. If you elect not to be there, which is your choice, then you submit and subject yourself to the vagaries of weather, which could be very, very uh, difficult and traumatic. Mr. Speaker, today, I'm, I'm being asked about the contract. Today, our own loans that we took from the banks, do you know how much you're paying in terms of interest? Even though at the outset, it wasn't like that. So that's, that's the fact of life. But Mr. Speaker, I would want to plead that this is a good endeavor. We should continue, and the finance minister should continue to en publicly engage.
to publicly engage so that people would have better appreciation of where we are and understand that we should all be contributing. Just as members of parliament are also contributing. And we hope we should be building confidence and trust. Once we open up much more than we have done, or maybe we did initially, people will come to appreciate and agree. And I will strongly urge the minister to continue from here, not end it in parliament, but to continue the public engagement. Mr. Speaker, I thank you and I thank you for the opportunity. And I believe all of us are wiser today after hearing the finance minister on this domestic debt exchange. I don't want to talk about the, the legalities that my colleague, the Honorable Mahama, raised. I disagree with him completely because this is not a new loan that is being contracted. I disagree with him totally. It's a new, not a new loan. But we can, have, we can have another platform to debate that. I agree. I believe that you are totally wrong in your understanding of the law. I thank you very much. Honorable members. Honorable members. Let me, on behalf of the House and all of you, thank the Minister for responding to our invitation to come to brief the House, which he has done comprehensively in a statement. And I want to commend members for the comments, even though the comments went to, into the arena of debate. But the situation demanded that. Well, I didn't get indication from the minister. You want to wind up? You want to wind up? Oh, OK. Uh, because it's a, a statement, usually we don't wind up, but you can come and thank members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And really, um, much appreciation for the comments um, that have come from the submission um, that I made. Mr. Speaker, um, we came in 2017 and met a very difficult economic situation. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we did not, we did not check away from it. And during the, the period through 2020, as you said, Honorable Okujeto mentioned, we were the poster child and the black star that was shining. So yes, in this current predicament, we would also navigate ourselves through it successfully. Mr. Speaker, on the issue of whether we have negotiated properly or not, let me be very clear that yes, Sri Lanka might have negotiated and gotten an SLA sometime in August. The consequence of that is that they are still not getting board approval. We can't afford that. We have to get a board approval by March and we are en route to being successful with that. And that's important. This, Mr. Speaker, we mentioned the impossible triangle of fiscal consolidation, um, debt treatment, and financial assurance. Mr. Speaker, when we talk about fiscal consolidation, it's really not only about revenue increases that we are looking to do. A significant issue, as was raised by the chairman of the Finance Committee, is one of expenditure controls. And those have come very clearly in our engagement over the past few months and our assessment of what we must do 
to be able to do that. So, Mr. Speaker, I assure you that those expenditure controls would happen. Mr. Speaker, we've been very impassioned about the issue of pensioners and um, retirees. Mr. Speaker, I just want to be very clear that the reason for this whole debt treatment to be voluntary is because you did not want to take anybody's money from them. Completely voluntary that it was your choice or not, and we'll have to manage that. So that was very clear. Mr. Speaker, we then also believed that treatment will be successful, which means, in effect, Mr. Speaker, that you are going to get very few of the old bonds in the system. And it's important to realize that. Now, the government does not control the market. So how do you then shield all those who may not voluntarily tender from the vagaries of the market. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, in realizing that 80% of retirees' um, bonds will mature over five years, we therefore brought the maturity to five years so that the time value of money was saved and captured. But more significantly, Mr. Speaker, it also meant that in the event of emergency, you were holding a paper that was common, that was tradable. So that then gave a choice for bondholders to do. Most of them did, which is perfectly fine, so that they will hold the old bond. And therefore, in yesterday's discussion with them, I sent a letter out to their convener stating what my colleague, Deputy Minister, mentioned very categorically, that all pension board holders who opted not to participate in the exercise are exempted from the DDEP. But Mr. Speaker, as we advise people about the future, in very tough economic circumstances. I think it's our responsibility for everybody to be aware of the risk that may occur from the market. And that is why we encourage that people trade in their bonds. But clearly, we've also stated categorically that your interest coupons and your principal would be on it. So, Mr. Speaker, let's put it to bed here. The government at no point in time looked at an opportunity to take money from pensioners because we made it, Mr. Speaker, voluntary. So you can't say that a voluntary exercise deems that I'm taking money from you. Then we gave an option which you were free to take, and most of them legitimately believe that they will hold their bonds to the very end. And if the both are going to hold their bonds to the very end, they don't require any option, which is perfectly fine. And we assured them that if your coupons will be on it, your principal will be on it. They then went further that even though you've given me that, I still want to say, hear the word exempt. So yesterday, we did that. So please, with the issue, as biblical as it is, protect your orphans and your widows and your old people. Yes, that is why it was voluntary from the beginning. No coercion by the state of our people. And our president was very clear about it. Don't go and legislate it in which you then say, wake up, all your bonds have been changed but make it voluntary so that it's their choice. But even though it's voluntary, it will then be subject to market vagaries. And so therefore, what option do you give them? And that's where we came up with 
allowed and brought the maturity to five years. So you can then begin to ask, what is the problem? And that is where majority leader is saying, maybe we did not communicate right. But truly, all of us sitting here, all the hyperbole, all the discourse, this is what the government or the people of Ghana did. And that is fact. So Mr. Speaker, I really appreciate this opportunity to make it very clear to us that this is a caring government, was clear on what this meant, and we made sure that we put things in place, but make it very clear so that people do not lead people astray. Mr. Speaker, we thank you for that. With regards to mentioning of Sri Lanka and Jamaica, Jamaica was a very different time. Sri Lanka, we are still trying to get a decision on the board, and we need to go to the board fast, and therefore the reasons why we negotiated what we negotiated without apology. And we will not, Mr. Speaker, run away from this problem. We are confident that we will solve it because we inherited such a situation and we solved it fastest growing economies in the world. So this would again happen. So let me, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much um, for this opportunity. Let's rest assured that we'll stabilize this economy and get our growth and get our shine back as we should. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Honorable members, thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister, let me assure you that this House and the Honourable Members are always more than prepared to support you to turn things around for the whole of the country. Because we are all affected by what happens despite our different political colors. And so any time you have some of these challenges, this is your home. This is where you should come to. A Jubilee House or the Flasar House represents the state. This house represents the people. This is where the powers are. And this is where sovereignty resides. Where the sovereignty is in the people. And we represent the people. And the powers of government are also in the people. And we represent them. So anytime there's any key issue, like a key policy, you need the approval of this house. Very important. You can get the go-ahead from the Jubilee House or Flasar House, but this house is the one that will have to approve and say it's in the interest of our people, go ahead to implement it. And so at any time you are having challenges, please, we are always prepared to receive you and to share views with you. Sometimes on the floor, the members may not be that, but when we meet outside the floor and discuss things dispassionately, I can tell you that members from both sides of the house propose solutions. And so those solutions could have helped us in approving something that we ourselves approved without having the full facts of the situation including the budget that we approved. We've had information, like you've given us today, there are some areas in the budget that we could have touched to help in the domestic debt restructuring. And so you are always welcome. I am fully aware that members know the challenges that we have in this country, major challenges such as waste, major challenges such as ignorance, and major challenges such as greed. And this house is properly positioned to assist any government to reduce these things. Waste, ignorance, and greed. That is part of greed. You know? We know how to do it. And we are elected to do so. So we can always support you to do a better job. We are not saying you don't do a good job, but a better job than we are, we are doing now. The pensioners were with me yesterday. 
and poured out their hearts, and I'm happy they met you too, and you were able to assure them that they will be exempted. And they are here today. Uh, they are even programmed to also picket, not only at your ministry, but also in Parliament. I'm happy to hear that they are exempted. And what I can tell you is that leave our pensioners alone. We can solve that without touching the pensioners' small money that we've given to them. With this, Oh, the Minister of Finance heard me clear and loud. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure he heard what I said. And so, once we have been able to surmount this, House, anytime you want to debate, please, you can submit a motion and I'll admit it with dispatch for us to dis debate the program. But, That, that is what I'm here for. I'm, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. But well, this one was comment debate. It was not debate. So I'm here for you and we'll try and get our people together because we keep on saying nobody should be left behind. And I want this to the IMF and the World Bank. They must, they must be better democratic than they are. Because in negotiating these things, they should hear from this house, parliament, and get our stamp. Then they carry the whole country along. When it is only with the executive, then it means that the post-war structures that we establish have outlived their usefulness. And we now have to get new structures including the United Nations, we have to change those structures to respond to the current realities of our time. That is notice to the IMF and the World Bank. With this, I thank all of you, and I hope that we have done enough for today. And uh, with your kind permission, I may want to adjourn the House. Leaders, yes. Leader, sit here, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thought once you have this platform, you are going to refer the statement to the Finance Committee and the Employment Committee and Social Welfare Committee so that we will continue the engagement and be able to soften the grounds until we get there. But Mr. Speaker, that notwithstanding, it's past two o'clock already. I think it's an appropriate time for us to bring down the curtains. So, we are in your hands. Yes, we have some agent business, but uh, I've been advised that uh, we could do it tomorrow, because leaders have to rush to some very critical meetings now. Um, I can see that members are also exhausted after such a passionate uh, debate. And so I'll proceed to adjourn the House. Yes, Majority Leader. The speaker, um, just remind that there are some outstanding businesses that we are to have transacted today. Um, I guess we may have to um, load them on tomorrow's order paper so that we'll be able to deal with them. As far as we are at and whilst we are engaging, I think we also should be a bit circumspect in not to mount a raid on the executive authority. I, I take a cue from some leading statements that have been made, including uh, uh, that motion should be introduced. But when they come, I'm, I'm hoping that the motion has not been admitted even before it's submitted. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I know you are listening attentively. I'm just saying that. You can always trust Mr. Speaker. <laughs> There's no motion before me. But at least that was anyway. the sense I got from both sides of the house. 
Well, that they don't mind debating a motion. And I said, I'm prepared. At any time you submit it, I'll admit it. Yes, I'm not too sure that anybody called. I say both sides of the house. I don't want to call names. I'm saying that during the course of this debate, I'm not sure that I heard anybody call for a motion from this other side. That I I, but, but let's see the nature of it. Once we want to build parliament, let's see the nature, the form and character of the motion, and we'll see what to do. But we should not be mindful to build parliament into a stronger institution. Let's figure out. So as the, my colleague has said, the is passed to and the finance committee have two different assignments to undertake. I noticed the ranking member is out. I don't know whether he started the engagement. But he's supposed to go with the chairman. I have two meetings, which they have scheduled for two o'clock. And I guess the caucuses also have some meetings at two o'clock. It's long past two. So Mr. Speaker, we are on your laps and uh, you may you may adjourn. Yes, we're talking about the uh, Finance Committee. Uh, there are a number of referrals before the Finance Committee. Uh, Chairman, Finance Committee. I refer so many things to your committee, and we are not, not hearing from you. So many, so many things. I don't want to mention them. Report back to the House that you are having challenges in these areas, then we know what to do. Spends for quite a long time. With this, honorable members, tomorrow Friday at 10 o'clock in the forenoon. The house is again. People are getting to appreciate what esports is because it's the future of work. There's so much that is attached to esports. Esports grew even more than the music and movie industry really? combined. Wow. We have uh, countries like South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana actively participating in esports tournaments across the world. Uh, esports or gaming at a point was seen to be for kubolos. Yes. Now <laughs> it's not for yeah. kubolos. I mean. One PlayStation 5 is about 12,000 Ghana cities. That's a lot of money. And that is sitting in somebody's room. Is that person yeah, a Kubo Lord? Yeah, no, I don't yeah. think so. Showing on Friday, February 17, 2023 on Ghana Web TV. What makes you different? One thing that uh, we really pride ourselves in is that we actually do our construction in-house. And that is something that I've always I think that it is one of our unique uh, advantages. But what we have done here at the Greens is to give you quality for not to also break the bank. And that is what we've tried to do. So this is a master bedroom. Whoa! Yeah, this is a master bedroom. This is lovely. Yes. This is a master bedroom. Oh, it has built-in wardrobe. Exactly. They're sending money back home from UK, Canada, and now US. I have something like an instant charge. I think we're telling you, are you unbeatable? We should be promo code Dr. Like it. Nigga, 10 pounds, 10 dollars, and now 10 Canadian dollars for the first transaction. We just send this guy a coffee. Download to Lemonade Finance.
can see as far as the volcanic uh, bank. Which is what you are seeing there? This is just an arm of it. Oh, okay. Yes, but the rest is further behind. I see. Hi there, welcome back. Remember we promised to bring you the details of our adventures here at Amejofe in the Volta region. Well, we begin today and we are beginning with a tour or a climb up the Mount Gemi. So come along with us. My name is Wandami Higan and this is People and Places. How is how are you today? I'm fine today. I'm very well. And you? I'm fine. I'm glad you are back again. Yes, we are glad to be back. Mm -hmm. We just know we are going to be tired in the process, but oh, it but it will still be fun. Are you it sure? I'm sure you, it's because you're used to it. Well, I'm used to it, but I still have to encourage you. Okay. Yes. So we are doing this with our very able tour guide. His name is Daniel Agbesi. He has been here for a while. For how long? Um, six years, I should say. So you see, more experience. He's going to be taking us up the mountain and then he would take us through the history of the place as well. So let's do this. Over to you. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you. Yeah. I would, um, as I said earlier on, that it is um, very easy climbing up. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the community is already on a mountain before this, and that makes it more easier. Your car has brought you very far from the base, as from the next community before you climb up here. And that is why it is easy climbing up. Okay. Yeah. And okay. then at a the point two, if you don't want to use the steeper route, you can use the more gentle one. So you don't get tired quickly. So there's a steeper route and there's a gentle one? Yes. So which one are we using now? Um, don't well, tell me. Looking at it? you, you are energetic and then I'm oh sure you've eaten God. something this morning already. It's a steeper route. So I think we can go uh, with the steeper one. Oh my. You can well, do it. Let's give it a try. You can let's do it. Let's see how far we can go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's very interesting, but if you are tired, we still can take a rest. Okay. We are not rushing. Hey. 
you don't have to go too fast. I'm sure you have some water on you. Yes, we do. All right. Are you tired? Well, not, not yet. Yeah. I'm sure there's still a long way to go, so. As I said earlier on, you still can take a rest if you are tired. Sure. Yeah. Sure. We don't have to be in rush. So can you just let our, our audience know what to, for instance, wear if you are coming for a climb up the mountain? Again? What should people wear? What is the right kit? If you are preparing to come for a climb, maybe you should wear sneakers. You can't come in sandals. Yes, the, the required thing is to be in sneakers. Okay. You can't come in sandals, except you are used to the place. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. For me, I can be in flip-flops and climb up the mountain. Because you are used to it. I am used to it. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. And do they necessarily have to have water on them? Of course, you have to. You will have to come with water, and that is the very first thing we um, we ask you, we advise you to do. Okay. All right. So as we move, we'll have more discussions. But do we know who, who found out about this mountain? Because I'm sure there are other mountains around, right? Yes, there are. So why is this specific one a tourist site now? Well, I, am, I would say this mountain actually became known mm. at the time of the Germans arrival in this community. Okay because they were missionaries and because of their church works mm. and that is why we even see the cross on the mountain so with them it becomes more popular okay yeah okay so it means before their arrival the inhabitants of Amejo Fair were using this place they weren't really using it okay yes okay they weren't using it so it, were, it was the germans that made it popular popular right yeah okay how many minutes do we have to get to i them think um, from the base of the mountain up to the peak we should be doing 20 minutes okay more or less okay but um, if you are tired as i said earlier we can take a rest at a point which may take us about 10 minutes. So are then we... from there, we can do the rest of the 10 minutes. Are we halfway yet? We are halfway. We are halfway. From here, you can also see the cross. Okay. And that is our target. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it took us like how many minutes from the base to... Um, I would say 10 minutes, I should 10 say. 10 minutes. Yes. Right. So yes. we have 10 minutes from the base to the middle of the mountain. Now we are just going to be climbing up so we get to the peak and then we'll continue our discussions. Come along with us. Let's do this. Halfway through the journey and I was so out of breath. I mean, you could hear that from the way I was speaking earlier. I could barely catch my breath. And our videographers did an amazing job. Just imagine pacing up the mountain, you know, running just to get good shots to make the video perfect for you. This is my director, Dr. Sankuma. She was our motivation at the beginning of this climb. But like they say, 
obia wone master Have you ever had anyone faint in the process of crying? No, 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 not at not all. Not yet. Not at all. I see. We sometimes also advise mm. those that may have um, um, ailments, problems, mm -hmm. like, for um, example, hypertension. Like hypertension or asthmatic patients. Okay. With them, sometimes they would be able to get to the peak, but we have to take much time. Oh, so it will take a longer it time. Take a longer time. I see. Because of their conditions. Their health condition. Yes. Oh my. We have a nice view today. It is. It's not very foggy today, so. But there's something missing again. We really? should be expecting two or three more rains. Today? No, in the subsequent days. Oh, okay. So that at least we can see as far as the water lake. Uh, Which is what you are seeing there? This is just an arm of it. Oh, okay. Yes, but the rest is further behind. I see. Yes. And you can see it on a very, very clear day. Also from here, looking Eastward, you can see uh, Mountain Agu from Togo. Whoa! Yes. That far? Yeah. From here? There is also a small cross on that mountain, erected also by the German missionaries. So it will be clearer when we get up there, right? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> so we can only see Looking it from at here. the weather, um, oh. you may be able to see it actually at the rainy season. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But as I said, if the weather gets clearer, mm. should we have more rains, you could see it. I see. Yeah. So we are almost at the peak, right? Yes. Are you tired? <laughs> I think it's not as hard as I thought it was. <laughs> I mean, from I the beginning, you, it's a bit tough, but... I told you it's easy. Once you're at yeah. the middle, I'm glad you are, you are not panting too fast. <laughs> <laughs> At least you are trying to expand your heart more. You know? Yeah. That is what we actually tell visitors. Mm. We encourage them to do more hikes. Oh, okay. So more that hikes. they more hikes, okay, walking yeah. distances. We are there now. Whoa. Aren't you happy? We are here. Ah. Yep. Woo. As I said, we, we are lucky. We can see a bit far. Okay. Yes, but it gets more clearer at the rainy season. So and this is the view from the top of Mount Gimi. We'll give you a 360 so you see how it looks like. And then we'll get to talk about this in a bit, but let's talk about the communities we see down there. How many communities do we well, have um, Actually, this area of ours is called the... Avatime Traditional Area. Okay. And we are having seven communities making all this area. Under Amejofe? No, under the Avatime tradition. So Amejofe is part of? Amejofe is part of the communities. Okay. And part of Avatime. Okay. Yes. So um, if I want to count them, you can see Vane from here. Mm. That is the last community before you get here. We have Jogbefeme. Okay. As you can see there. We have Biakba, we have uh, Fume, Jokbe ahead, mm. we have Bajeme down in the valley here, 
and then Amejope. So, so Amejope is the only one on the mountain? On the mountain. The rest of them are in the valley? In the valleys. But if you look at them critically as well, you realize um, Biakpa is a bit higher than Fume. Mm -hmm. is also higher, higher than, than Fume. And then it cut across like that. Okay. If you look at it again, you realize Bajeme from this end mm -hmm. is higher than Fume. So Fume and Jogbe are the are lowest. The lowest. Alright. Yes, as you can see that one. But this is a beautiful scene. Of course. I told you. Very beautiful. And a lot of greens. And what uh, makes it also is that these communities are neighboring communities. Mm. And so we all speak the same dialect. Which is? Which is Sia. Sia. Yes. Or Sideme. Okay. It's part of the Guan dialect. Okay. Yes. Right. We, Sia. we speak a bit all right. Mm -hmm. But among ourselves, mm. we speak this particular dialect. Okay. We speak every only if we meet an every speaking person. Right. Yeah. Okay. We speak it very well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And these communities also celebrate a festival, mm -hmm. which is a um, rice festival. Mm. But in the dialect, we call rice amu. Amu. Yes. Which is brown rice. It's similar to amu chi, festival. like emu. Yes. So you amu. See, yes. Right. Um, at the time of the uh, migrations of mm. our people, they come across uh, so many different languages. And so that is why the interaction of these different kind of words. There is a um, tree in it, there is um, eve, there is also gan. All in one? Yes, in this dialect of ours. Oh, okay. Yes. Wow. If you, you can speak those uh, languages, it's then you, you can detect. Here. It is not really easy. But you can except, tell. Except you want to stay in the community for some time. Mm. Uh -huh. Then you can learn it. I see. Yes. Okay. But it's relatively easy to tell that this person is saying this. If yes. you understand any yes. of the three languages. You, you, you can only detect by the actions of the person. Mm. Yes. Okay. And a typical every person cannot understand if I speak. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, okay, except right. I interpret to that person. Mm. Yeah. One other thing is that there's a lot of folk on top of the mountain. So you see beyond you, but you don't see too much. Yes. Because there's, there's, it's like a mist covering the rest of Is that how it always is? Uh, it's not been like this always. I would say it is because of the dry season in which we are now. Mm. Yes, otherwise you could have seen as far as the water lake. You okay. could see Pando, Germany, Tokon, all this. All oh, along really? the Volta Lake. Yes. From here? From here. Wow. Yes. Okay. And because of um, this uh, dry season, as I said, mm -hmm. that is why the mist is yes, all over. It's all over. Okay. But at the rainy season, mm -hmm. it's when you can see that much. Right. Also, from this end, you can see Mountain Agu from Togo. On this side? Yes. Okay. Further ahead. You can see Mountain, Mountain Agu. In Togo. Mountain Agu, Agu in Togo. Yes. You can see Togo from Ghana. <laughs> of course. Wow. <laughs> that is on a very clear weather. Okay. Yes. Okay. Wow. It is That's easy to nice. be seen from here. Very easy. That's nice. Okay, so now let's talk about the cross. Um well, um, it's a nice cross, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but you can see it's been here for a while. Of course. Do we know yes. how long? Um, since 1939. Okay, yes. that's very long. 39? Yeah. Before some of us we, were We, we celebrated the um, 100 years, I think, four years ago. Wow. Yes. Actually, it was erected by the German missionaries. Okay to commemorate their first jubilee they had after the establishment of the EP church. When they came here? When they came here. That is, if you look up at the peak, you can see the church house. Mm -hmm. And also a yellow painted tall building mm -hmm. where they started their seminary. Okay. 
but now the administration for the teacher training college. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the steps to the entrance are about 60. Mm -hmm. Of the church, of right? The church. Yes, we are going to be going there. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll learn more about I that. Guess, I guess you have more energy. Of course, of course. And we promise the audience, sure. so we must get that to Also, I'm um, attached to the cross was an antenna. Mm -hmm. which um, has been taken off. It was then used as radio communication from home. Oh, from home? Yes, they communicate back from Germany. Germany. Oh, okay. Yes, but it's been taken out because it was blocking the waves of mm. um, TV and radio uh, stations. I see. Yes. Okay. But is there any belief that if you touch the cross, there's any blessing or anything like that? Um, well, that has to do with your Personal. faith. Personal. Okay. Yes. Yeah. People come here to pray almost every day. Yes. Wow. And I would say it has to do with your Personal. faith. Yes. If you have the faith that if you climb here and pray... At the foot of the cross. Yes. There will be a change in your life. Mm -hmm has to do with you. Okay. Yeah. But there are people who do that. There people are people who come that. here to people pray. People come here. You can, you, you can hardly come here and don't see anyone. Okay. Yes. Individuals and groups. Individuals and groups. Wow. Yes. Right. You can meet them here early mornings and later in the evenings. Sure. Yes. Sure. Sometimes because of the, the sunshine, they don't stay here for long. Mm. But they descend further to the valley where the, there are shade of trees, so they can sit the whole day. One other interesting thing about this mountain is that the residents of this area, together with people who have moved out of Amejofe to go do their own things in other regions, they all come back on Easter Monday every year and they climb up the mountain. It's an annual ritual where they meet, sing, preach and pray on top of the mountain. After that, they all descend together. They meet at the market square and then the Easter activities continue. So how tall is this mountain? Well, the mountain is about 2,700 feet okay. above sea level. Okay. Yes. And it's the second highest the second in Ghana? The second highest in Ghana. Wow. So it's about 755.5 meters high. Mm. Yeah. But the community, which is the highest habitation, is about 2,400 mm. feet above sea level. That's the highest human, human settlement. settlement. Which town is that? This is Amejofe. I'm talking about Amejofe, Amejofe. Okay. community. So that's the one we, we see in view ahead of us, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so you can here we the are cross. at the how, cross, not of Calvary. How did you feel? <laughs> Normal, I guess. <laughs> I think I'm not applying faith <laughs> now, so yeah, okay. but we've learned all about the cross and we are at the peak of the second highest mountain in Ghana, yes. mountain Gemi. Gemi. Is there a meaning to the, the, the name? What um, does Gemi mean? Gemi actually um, has to do with a um, certain uh, grass, Mm. Our people came to meet at the base of the mountain. Okay. Yes. And decided to name it after the mountain. Mm. And in the dialect, it was a gemina. Okay. A gemina. But um, at the arrival of the German missions, mm. they couldn't pronounce the word a gemina and therefore shortened it gemina. Gemi. Oh, okay. So there you have it. it. The meaning of gemi. Gemi. It's formed from the name of a grass. Yes, elephant grass. Oh, right. Yes. And it is called a gemina. A gemina. 
Okay, so we are all done here. Uh, it took us approximately 20 minutes, but it depends on your pace. If you are fast, maybe you exercise already, it will be easier for you to come up. But if you are like me, it may take you some time. You may have to take courses in between. But the most important thing is that you have your sneakers and you have your water. So you can sip in between when you're tired. So we'll be descending now and then we'll end our tour of Mount Gemi. But we did this with Daniel. So let's get down there. You've not drunk the water. And right? then we'll wrap up. Not yet. You when you are going out, do that. a bit. Sure. <laughs> so let's get going. So we were all done on top of the mountain. But of course, we couldn't leave without taking photos, selfies, and, you know, posing here and there after all the walk up this mountain. So we took a little while to do that. Descending was much easier for us than oh, when we were okay. climbing. So you can see we were moving at a faster pace than when we were climbing. And just when I thought I was almost there, there were you, I missed a step. Yes, it's a different one. <laughs> and I was so unlucky, the cameras captured this. She didn't get me for this, she only got me standing now. What a mistake. We are wrapping up, we are down the mountain, we went up to Mount Gemi, which I said is the highest, second highest mountain, um, the second highest mountain in Ghana. The first highest of course we know is Mount Afajatu, or Afajatu, which is the same thing. So yeah, it was an experience. Fortunately for us, we took the gentle trail when we were descending. But when you're going up, you usually will use the steep, the steeper trail, right? Yes. Just to have an experience, because that is more difficult to climb. But the gentle, um, the gentle trail is easier when you are coming down. So that's the path we used. So we did this together with Daniel 
who took us through all the way to the top and back down here. So thank you for joining us in this adventure. I'm sure you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you in our next one. Don't miss out. My name is Wanda Amihegan and this is People and Places. Thank you.